I think we're going to uh, honor uh, everyone's punctuality and time today. So we'll go ahead and get started. This uh, session will be recorded and um, we do have everyone uh, muted as they come in just because of the number of people that we had registered for this session. So we have 300 on the call right now, but uh, we may uh, approach uh, four or five or, or possibly 600 as the day goes on. So I uh, want to welcome you uh, to this session entitled Enhancing Early Literacy Outcomes, Closing Research to Practice Gaps Through the Science of Reading uh, via Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. And my name is Jen Collins, and I serve in the capacity of statewide lead consultant for multi-tiered systems of support. And I'm joined by a number of my colleagues on the statewide team uh, who will be presenting today, uh, and who will also be facilitating the expertise of nationally known experts uh, within the, the science of reading uh, field. And uh, so I want to acknowledge our three MTSS regional leads, and they're, they're going to wave if they would. The first is Karen Brady. She is the Central Region MTSS regional lead. Uh, the second is Laura Lamont. She serves as the MTSS regional lead for the Western Region. And we also have Donna Halpin, who serves as the Eastern MTSS Regional Lead. And so part of what we do through uh, Pennsylvania's Multi-Tiered Systems of Support Initiative on a statewide level is coordinate um, different, um, a different continuum of training and technical assistance across the three regional offices so that you have access to, uh, in some cases, participating in year-long series, uh, which is what you're, what you're joining today, you're joining the efforts of some teams who will be working on enhancing early literacy outcomes over the course of the 21-22 school year. And then we also have a number of uh, standalone sessions that uh, typically are, are in half-day increments. Today's a little bit different, um, but for the most part, when we look forward um, to 21-22, we'll be advertising a number of half-day sessions related to enhancing early literacy outcomes among other topics um, with, within the context of a multi-tiered system of support. So um, we're thinking that you're joining today, uh, not just because you're a member of one of our participating teams, but because you're interested in enhancing early literacy outcomes and you're interested in learning more uh, about this 30 years or so of what we call the science of reading, which has been collected across a number of universities, a number of practitioners uh, over the course of, of more than 30 years now. So it is considered to be a settled science and we'll be sharing uh, facets of that settled science with you today so that that, uh, as you begin to um, further or deepen your knowledge related to the science of reading, you begin to translate that into practice. And uh, many of the things we'll be covering today can be done face to face with students and or remotely. Um, so we want to we want to acknowledge that as well. Um, we will be starting out uh, with some introductions or acknowledgements of um, our participating teams. These are teams that applied to be in a year-long series to focus on enhancing early literacy outcomes, and they have quite a charge. Uh, they will be, they have uh, been participating in ECRI training, which stands for Enhanced Core Reading Instruction, and they will be uh, implementing ECRI practices with uh, their students who they'll be focused on at the K to two levels. And uh, their charge is to uh, really enhance literacy outcomes, uh, meaning um, to, the goal would be able to get all students, K to one minimally, um, to proficiency by spring of 2022. So uh, that's the goal for all of our teams and uh, we'll be supporting them through that process. But we wanna give a shout out to uh, start with our Eastern teams and then we'll, we'll acknowledge um, our other teams. So who am I turning this over to? Um, Sherry or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I'd just like to welcome the folks from Gockley Elementary School, as well as Fogelsville um, Veterans Memorial and Kernsville Elementary School, which are in the Parkland School District, Gockley Elementary School is in Whitehall Copley, um, the Lehighton Primary Center from Lehighton, and the Wyoming Area Primary Center 
um, in the Wyoming area school district. So we know that they're very excited to get started and we have been enjoying interacting with them as we move forward. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Central Region teams. Good morning, everyone. So glad that you're able to join us today. Uh, those on our teams and then also um, those that are joining us as the masses. Today we have uh, Westmont Hilltop Elementary and we also have Tussey Mountain Elementary School, both being serviced by Megan Horsch and Amanda Williamson from IU8 uh, with their consultation. And we also have Kernsville Elementary um, and Mountaintop Area Elementary in the IU10 area being uh, supported by Lauren Smith and Heather Spots. And we also have Jersey Shore Elementary with who's being uh, supported by Amanda Carafa in IU17. So we're really excited that these teams are gonna be going in that year long process and I uh, can't wait to see about their outcomes. And finally, uh, these are our Western Region teams. Thanks so much, Jen. Today we have Logan Elementary from East Allegheny School Dist District being supported by Kate Stuckey at IU3, Red Bank Valley Primary um, being supported by Dina Croyle at IU6, Norvell Elementary from the Mount Pleasant School District being supported by Dr. Tyler Roberto at IU7, Broad Street Elementary from the Butler School District being supported by Edna Black, and lastly, Burgett's Town School District, who is being supported by Peter Demensic at IU1. Great. Well, again, welcome and congratulations to uh, all of our teams and welcome to everyone else um, who's made the time to join today and uh, learn uh, uh, with, with us. So um, uh, these, just, to, just so you have a sense of what, what each of these teams will be doing, they have to attend uh, a number of training days over the course of the 21-22 school year. Uh, we will be providing uh, at least two virtual site visits with them um, to uh, assist with any implementation uh, needs that they have. And they have to um, also uh, showcase, if you will, their implementation efforts around enhancing core reading instruction practices, so those ECRI principles and practices, and also other things they'll be doing to refine their tiered system of support, um, particularly things that they'll be doing to increase intensity and, and to help differentiate between what they do at tier two versus what they do at tier three. They will also uh, be expanding their pharmacy, if you will, to to adopt um, other evidence-based practices outside of ECRI practices um, that they will use uh, with students who need very, very intensive um, support. So again, we, we define that as tier three. And again, all the while having a focus on enhancing outcomes uh, for all students. So uh, that's what they're, they're slated to kind of do over the course of time. And um, together with their IU consultants, we'll be supporting those efforts. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Karen. Is this the point where you want to do just some a little refresher on annotating? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate that. Good morning. As part of our uh, um, ability to interact with you, um, we would like you to uh, consider annotating some slides as we go through our presentation today. For those of you who may not be familiar with the annotation um, uh, option or ability, you'll go up to the top of your screen and you'll see uh, the view options. So Jen, if you'll click on that. I'm sorry, I just hit the, hit the space bar. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so just hit the space bar and you're, there we go. So at the top of your screen, you're gonna see the view options. And then Jen, if you'll click again, when you click on the view options button, you will see a variety of options that, that you have available when you do annotating. So um, on Jennifer, you'll click again. One of the things we're gonna be asking you to do is to do text annotation um, on, when we ask you to, not now. Um, then we will ask you to pick a color under format over to the right there. That's so that your annotations do not um, you know, overlap on each other. If you click again, Jen, you'll also see that there's a stamp option as well. And that's the one we're gonna be practicing today. Next screen, please. So you might notice here that you have renamed yourself so that you could have the format of your school, your role, and then your name. 
going to ask you to practice the annotation feature today with the stamp. So if you go up to your view options at the top and click the uh, stamp option, we'd like you to select one of those stamps and put your stamp next to your name. If you're um, and your school, excuse me, your school district. If you are an other, somebody joining us outside of the cohort, you can go ahead and stamp right there next to other. Wow, Jen, look at all those people. It's impressive. It is. Love it. So that, that's the stamp feature. Um, a little bit later today, we're going to be asking you to do the text feature. Very cool. All right. Looks like we still have some people trying it out. So if you're ever in a virtual setting again and you want folks to facilitate and participate with this process, you can go ahead and use this um, annotation feature um, in your own instruction if you haven't already. All right, everybody, I'm going to clear all the stamps at this point, but we do thank you for participating in that so that in the future we can um, have you participate. So whenever you're ready, Jen, we're ready to move on. Okay, uh, well, just a, just a few upfront kind of um, gratitude statements, and, and that is, is that we really are grateful to be learning with and through you today and appreciate your commitment um, to enhancing early literacy outcomes. If if the, if the term ECRI is completely new to you because we do have folks joining outside of our teams who are being trained in ECRI, it stands for Enhanced Core Reading Instruction. And you can Google ECRI and University of Oregon and learn more about uh, the effectiveness of ECRI practices. Um, in fact, I think Maggie or someone might be willing to put the link um, to ECRI uh, directly in the chat box for you to access. And uh, we also want to acknowledge that we all exist on a continuum of readiness and uh, growth and experience. And so um, the assumption always is that uh, all educators are doing their best, all administrators are doing their best, and uh, knowing that your students and families and communities are, are super resilient. So we hope that uh, you're looking forward to this upcoming year and that some of the information we impart today and that you engage in today uh, will be helpful as you move forward with whatever your goals are around enhancing early literacy outcomes. Uh, I already mentioned that ECRI stands for Enhanced Core Reading Instruction, and uh, not only is it designed to enhance core reading instruction, it's really a form of what we would call class-wide acceleration. So uh, many of you know that um, learning loss was inevitable for many students K-12 to uh, last year, and uh, to some extent, uh, the spring, uh, the year that, that we experienced uh, the onset of COVID. And so uh, one of the things that we're really uh, trying to promote nationally and otherwise is this idea of class-wide acceleration or class-wide intervention, intervention acceleration are synonymous terms for all students. And so ECRI is a form of that. It also happens to be an evidence-based practice because it's derived from explicit instruction. And so uh, uh, if you go to uh, the ECRI link, um, you, can, you can learn a little bit more of those details um, as our teams you know, are, have been doing and, and will be doing throughout the next year. We're also recommending that um, you uh, allow uh, for some recoupment time, um, you, you enact class-wide intervention, you enact small group instruction, aka advanced tier supports for those students who um, you know based on spring data would benefit from those supports right off the bat, and then use your fall screening to validate your spring screening results. So in, in all cases, every year, the most reliable and valid data you have to inform what should happen pretty much right off the bat for kids the following school year as they matriculate to the next grade level is your end of year spring benchmark data. And uh, that should, that spring benchmark data should um, coincide or should, should be validated by all the other data that you've collected the year before on your kids. 
So uh, fall screening then sh can wait, can be can be delayed, if you will. Um, and, and even when you look at the time period for fall, it's, it's typically August, September, and October. So you can wait until about mid-October, and that should really just validate, with the exception of, of kids who are transferring to your district for the first time, that should validate what you what you already had gathered in spring. And so um, uh, that's just something we want you to keep in mind. Rely on spring data to inform what you're doing the following year uh, with, with all kids, and then uh, particularly with kids who are more vulnerable. And so uh, we mentioned one of the most effective ways to enhance uh, any type of instruction, whether the focus is on early reading acquisition or um, uh, content area teaching at the, the middle and, and high school levels, um, the goal is to explicit it up. And that term is code for an I do, we do, you do approach. Um, and so the majority of students um, really need something like this. And I do, we 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 do, you do approach. Um, lots of we do's in between the I do and the you do. Um, and that's that's where the majority of students are falling. Uh, there are very few students who get away with learning something deeply with just a couple of we do's. Um, so the majority of our students need a healthy amount of those. And what explicit instruction does in terms of design and delivery is that it, is it naturally helps helps you um, to prepare and actually create opportunities for all those we do's. So explicit instruction is the way to go. And again, it's a K to 12 evidence-based methodology, and it happens to be embedded in enhanced core rating instruction uh, routines, which is why um, we're training our teams in uh, the use of ECRI. So uh, hopefully at this point, you have access to um, our live binder and specifically the handouts for today, which can be found under day five of the EELO uh, tab. And uh, please make sure you have this handy and don't lose it after today because this live binder has been built over time, uh, about five, six years in the making. And so what we try to do is purge or sift through all those resources that may be on the internet and may be accessible to you, but may not be um, derived from empirical research or evidence. So this is a pretty tight um, uh, repository of resources that are very high quality and are those resources that link directly back to um, 30 years of the science of reading. Um, we are Patton. Uh, if you're not familiar with Patton, Patton represents Pennsylvania's Training and Technical Assistance Network, and we support uh, directly the Bureau of Special Education, but more so, uh, we support the rollout of initiatives that are uh, federally funded. And uh, we're the, each of the offices are, in, are responsible uh, primarily for uh, rolling out uh, different initiatives and training and technical assistance efforts that fall under different initiatives initiatives. And so you happen to be today um, learning through the MTSS initiative. And uh, our goal is to um, enhance outcomes within MTSS for all students, including students with disabilities. And so part of that is creating a system of supports and services that are fluid and flexible enough to meet the needs of any student at any time, again, including students with disabilities. Uh, our goal is to maximize access to general education and to build those supports and services within the general education hospital, if you will, um, because that is the least restrictive environment. And in terms of students with IEPs, we find that students with disabilities have better outcomes uh, when they are maximally participative uh, and included within the general education setting. So just to add that um, as an add on to this slide. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to be talking briefly just about the conceptual underpinnings of multi-tiered systems of support, but particularly as they relate to the science of reading. So um, MTSS didn't just happen. It, it is very, very connected um, to the science of reading, and the two work hand in hand. So I just want to touch on that. And then 
uh, my colleague Karen Brady will be helping out with um, exposing you to one of our implementation guidance documents um, around fidelity of the components of a multi-tiered system of support. So uh, even though your lens may be enhancing early reading outcomes, any uh, targeted effort or school improvement effort involves um, having multiple prongs in the fire simultaneously and well, meaning with fidelity. And so we're gonna take you to a document that helps you kind of look at your system uh, more in depthly. And it's a document that's intended for you to revisit uh, as you continue to work on your goals and your outcomes within your system and your school. We are, then are gonna progress to um, a, a deeper dive into the science of reading. And um, we are going to do that through Emily Hanford's uh, keynote address. Uh, every year, uh, our, our statewide literacy team, uh, or not every year, but it seems like every year, has a, a huge uh, literacy symposium with the best of the best. And if you haven't been able to attend that literacy symposium, we would highly recommend it because it's all these folks from the science of reading community. And so today you'll hear from Emily Hanford. This afternoon, we'll be taking a deeper dive into phonological awareness. And then we'll be closing with um, more information around dyslexia. So if you don't know, and this uh, notwithstanding what we're doing in Pennsylvania, there's been a huge effort to um, sweep the nation with understanding of how to mitigate and or prevent early reading and or word level difficulties altogether for all students. And so sometimes policy precedes practice, although uh, what we will say is this 30 years of information related to how we learn to read and how to really prevent early reading difficulties for uh, the majority of kids, we would say all kids, um, has been around for a long time, just not has not necessarily uniformly made its way into practice, but we're getting there. And so uh, Dr. Jack Fletcher's keynote will be speaking to some of the underpinnings of dyslexia, and I think will give you a really solid foundation. Um, and we'll also connect you with resources um, that are intended for you as practitioners and for families. Okay, so that is our agenda. So today, and building on the intentions of enhancing early literacy outcomes for our teams and anyone else who's vested in that, um, one of the intentions is always to continue to align your professional learning, your knowledge, and practice with the science of reading. So uh, kind of what we're doing is setting aside um, experiences that we've had or uh, maybe prior training um, that conflicts with some of the information that you um, have heard or might hear today, uh, that we're setting that aside and we're understanding that research takes a long time to collect and that when we have 30 years of converging biological and behavioral research around the science of reading, that that's something to take pause over and begin to enact within our practice if we want to see different kinds of outcomes uh, for the majority of kids. We also want to help you better identify where, when, and why your students struggle because uh, this, is, this is complex stuff. And so diagnostic skills are needed. Um, very, very sound pedagogical skills are needed and evidence-based tools are needed. And when those things work in concert, uh, we get maximum benefit in terms of prevention of long-term reading difficulties for all students. We also wanna help you begin to think about your continuum of evidence-based methodologies. And so sometimes what we think is evidence-based um, uh, may not uh, meet all the criteria associated with practices that are really going to move the needle um, in terms of kids who are more vulnerable. So uh, we wanna make sure that um, you're looking at your pharmacy, so to speak, and that you have um, a continuum of evidence-based practices um, to rely upon as we're intensifying instruction um, and intervention for more vulnerable kids. We do also want you to think about your intensity 
at tier two versus your intensity at tier three. And while we won't be getting into that um, today, it's just something for you to consider. Um, we do have trainings that will be speaking to that. And there, there's a lot of information out there and the resources that we'll provide around helping you to differentiate between what you do at tier two and what you, what you might offer at tier three. And then getting kids to know, getting kids what they need uh, when they need it. So uh, the fluidity and flexibility of a multi-tiered system of support is critical. And um, uh, that's something also you want to reassess when you're going into the document that helps you look at fidelity. And then finally, developing um, high but realistic goals and, and growth uh, for all students. And so that means looking at your data in a little bit of a different way. And so if you haven't heard about student growth percentile data, uh, that is uh, a source of data that's in most of the systems that you're using. And um, you might want to turn to your IU consultant for some additional support um, with student growth percentiles. Um, in Pennsylvania, we've talked a lot about rate of improvement. Uh, we're expanding uh, RTI methodologies, response to intervention methodologies to include rate of improvement, but also mastery measurement and particularly student growth percentiles. So those are the goals for our teams. We're not gonna be able to cover all of those today, but, but as you're thinking about, well, I'm not on a team, uh, what, what might I kind of look to, uh, even though I might not be on one of these teams this year, um, these are things that, that could be uh, prioritized for professional development. So um, let's just talk a little bit about whether you have a common language um, in your setting around multi-tiered systems of support. And um, as you can see, as, as this initiative has evolved um, over the course of now probably 25 years, um, we used to call it way back when nationally response to intervention. And then people kind of took pause and said, maybe that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the focus here is not on intervention. The focus really is on a broader um, framework that has to do with school improvement. And school improvement goes way beyond, you know, a half hour in the day when we're providing supplemental intervention. Um, school improvement is first and foremost about high quality standards aligned core instruction using powerful methodologies um, to engage kids and to move all kids forward. So we evolve from things like response to intervention or school-wide models or even three-tiered models to calling um, uh, tiered systems, multi-tiered systems of support uh, for that reason. Within multi-tiered systems of support, the problem solving process is inherent. And that means we're constantly looking toward what are our goals for all kids. Um, and uh, you know what we always say to our teams who participate in our series is that school improvement is a continuous process. There is no finish line. And so problem solving is gonna be a part of every level. It's gonna be a part of the systems level. It's gonna be a part of the grade level. And it's gonna be a part of the individual student uh, level, which is what we call tier three. The other um, sometimes um, source of, of um, needed uh, communication and clarity is this difference between RTI and MTSS. So if we don't call it response intervention gen anymore and we call it MTSS, what is RTI? What is response to intervention? What does that mean? And uh, to differentiate between the two, we said that multi-tiered systems of support are a comprehensive school, impra school improvement framework or umbrella of components that all need to work simultaneously um, to yield outcomes. And then RTI is one of the components within a multi-tiered system of support that, um, that speaks to um, a student's response to the medicine that we're pouring in, not just through core instruction, but also through supplemental intervention. And that response is typically calculated or determined by their growth 
or what we call lack thereof. So we either say they have an adequate response to intervention, or sometimes we say they have an inadequate response to intervention. And then that leads the problem solving team with the um, inclusion of the child's family to make certain decisions about what we call specific learning disabilities determination or identification. So um, in this model within a multi-tiered system of support, we talk about the use of response to intervention rather than ability achievement discrepancy to um, capture the student's response to what we're doing within the confines of the general education hospital. So it has lots to do again with access to um, your pharmacy, what you have going on at the core level, what you have going on at supplemental intervention, and then capturing a student's response to that if in fact they're vulnerable so that we know uh, one, how to hone what's going on in the general education hospital, and two, uh, if indeed we really do need to go to disability determination and secure the provisions um, of special education services. So I hope that makes sense. There, there still is confusion. The two terms get conflated. Um, they're related, but they're not the same. And so RTI is the assessment process. MTSS is the overarching system. So, so we sometimes worry when we hear schools talk about having an MTSS teacher who does MTSS time, um, we're not quite sure what that means because everyone is doing um, MTSS. Everyone is in a surveillance system where we are monitoring uh, the behavior, social, emotional, and academic outcomes of all students. That's the system. RTI is the capturing through assessment of how kids are responding to what we have in our system or our hospital. So I hope that makes sense. And um, that's something to keep talking about with your colleagues if they're not here today. So we get everyone on the same page about what is it that we're calling our model? What is our model? Um, what do we do in terms of comprehensive school improvement? Uh, where are areas we need to work on? Where are areas we feel good about? And that comes to the, the components. So before we have you look at your own components, I wanna just play uh, a little video. This has been around for a long time. It's, it's from Amy, Amy Henry out of Michigan. And um, she takes everything that we just reviewed and, and um, reiterates it, but in a Michigan friendly way. So I'm just going to play this for you. And um, maybe what I'll ask you to do, because uh, I've been talking here for a while, is to put anything that resonates with you uh, from Amy Henry's words about seven minutes here or so uh, in the chat box. So anything she says that makes sense to you and that you either knew KNEW or might be new NEW to you. So here's Amy Henry. And maybe not. I'll try there she is. Maybe it's just doing a little intro here. I think you might have an ad. Yeah, maybe. I hope. Grammarly is your personal writing My name is Amy Henry. I work with the Michigan Department of Education as an education consultant. I'm in the Office of Improvement and Innovation, and yeah. I'm in the School Improvement Unit yeah. specifically working with I the statewide systems of support. So we work to support these now come together. Okay. Just like we did this morning. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. for the priority and focus schools around the state. So one of the priorities at the state of Michigan is to make sure that everyone understands that MTSS and school improvement are not two separate bodies of work. MTSS is the work of MTSS is meant to be embedded right within that school improvement process. You can take the language and put it right into your plan. The work of MTSS should be the work of your school improvement plan. Uh, Michigan's definition of MTSS is an integrated, multi-tiered system of support that's really focused on your instruction, 
your intervention, and your assessment. And it's really meant to meet the needs of the, uh, the academic achievement of a student, but also the behavioral health of a student. Um, you often see that triangle, and, and there's a line dividing it right down the middle. And that line can stand for a few different things, but most commonly you'll hear that the one side of the triangle is talking about academics, and the other is talking about that behavioral health. And we want to be able to see that student as a whole student, rather than looking at just, oh, this is how they're doing in math, or this is how they're doing in reading. We want to be able to look at every aspect of that student. Um, the number one predictor of academic achievement is academically engaged time. So when we address that full student, we're able to get at the factors that maybe we don't see from a test that we're giving around reading or math. So in our state, we've really had this really tight focus around um, the achievement gap and what we're seeing with our bottom 30% and our top 30%, this huge distance between the two. And when we talk about the practices of MTSS, we're talking about hitting every student that walks in our door. We're talking about there not being an achievement gap. We're talking about leveling the playing field so that every student has access to the type of instruction that they need. Uh, we're talking about students not being behind. We don't want to see our students two and three years behind. We want to see them at benchmark. And when we're able to come in and identify their areas of need, we're able to provide instruction based on that area of need. So that student won't be left behind. That student won't be, be so far behind their peers that they're unable to catch up. We'll continue to see one year, two years, possibly three years of growth in that one year time because we're going to target the areas of need for our students. So we're addressing every student in the classroom, whether it be the high achiever or the low achiever or the right on par achiever, we're going to hit each one of their, their levels and we're going to be sure that they're challenged and they're engaged in their own education. So one of the most common misconceptions around MTSS is that it's a way of intervening for students who are low performing. And that is so far from the truth because MTSS is not an intervention. It's not an intervention program. MTSS is best practice around instruction for our students, and it's meeting the needs of all students. The, the student that's above benchmark, the student that's on benchmark, and the student that's below benchmark. So we have to be very clear when we're working with people to make sure that they don't have RTI time or MTSS time and say that they're actually implementing MTSS because that's not the case. You can't have a block of 30 minutes where you work with low performing students and say I'm doing MTSS because that's not MTSS. MTSS is for all students. So with MTSS, the idea is that you're meeting the needs of all your students in your classroom. So say I am a kindergarten teacher, which we've seen this in many kindergarten classrooms. I've got students coming to me with all different levels, and they need all different kinds of support. And I might find that maybe only 50% of my kids are at benchmark when they walk in my door. Um, thinking about that in a fiscal way, we know that we can't provide the supports to 50% of our kids that are individualized. We're not going to be able to do that. We just don't have the resources at this, this time to do that. So when we see those types of numbers, we need to understand that the supports we need to provide need to be embedded into our tier one instruction, which is our just general gen ed teacher providing instruction in the classroom day to day. Um, and the, the cool thing about that is there's been this huge push around like um, universal design for learning and differentiated instruction and all of these different strategies that are really best practice strategies. And those get at the heart of MTSS, which is to meet the needs of all of those students. If the tier one instruction isn't meeting the needs of those students to begin with, then you're not going to see that tier two or tier three is ever effective. We've tracked data, we've followed kids, we've got 10 years worth in one district we worked with, and we followed these kids. And when they were at tier one instruction, um, or tier two instruction, and then moved into tier one, and then kind of lost, I mean, it's kind of a weird way to put it, but they lost those supports, they would cycle in and out of tier one and tier two instruction. They would continually go in and out because the problem wasn't at the tier two or tier three level. The problem was at the tier one level, and we have to beef up that instruction. We can't change the students that are walking in our door. We can't change what we get. We have to change what we give. So we have to change how we're providing our instruction and how we're meeting the needs of those kids. If 50% are below benchmark, that means our instruction needs to be beefed up so that 80% can get at benchmark. And we have to do that in the tier one universal level. I think about what our teachers need when they're doing this work. They need supports, they need to know what to do. What do you do with a third grade reader that walks into a 12th grade English class? How do you provide supports for them? They need that leadership support, they need training, they need coaching, they need to have job embedded practices that are put in on their plate that they can just take out. They need to have tools and resources. Um, and MTSS is that. It's it's. It's the whole idea of being able to pull from an arsenal of places and being able to provide those multi-levels of support that those students might need that walk in your classroom.
Okay. Uh, so if you would go ahead and put in the chat anything that she, anything that you heard from Amy Henry that um, was either new or new, either you knew or is new to you, anything that resonated with you. And you're thinking about where you are in practice, your model, your school, your kids. change what we give, MTSS is not the half hour during the day of intervention, meeting the needs for all kids. Great, give versus get, tier one has to be effective. Good, good. A lot of common observations and insights here, which is nice. So this was intended really to be validating for you. Um, uh, and we know it's hard sometimes to um, get everyone on the same page um, uh, in your system, um, uh, but, but these kinds of experiences continue to validate that for you, you're, you're on the right track in terms of your thinking and then uh, marrying that thinking with actual practice. So great. Um, she has uh, two other um, sections of, you know, this talk that she does. I just showed you the first of three, um, but all you have to do if you want to see the other two is just Google Amy Henry MTSS and you can see uh, the other two parts. So I want to move now to, um, and again, thanks for, for putting your thoughts into the chat. I want to move now to just um, highlighting a few things uh, regarding what MTSS is versus what it's not. And um, I think you all get that it's, it's not the half hour in the day. Um, what we do want to stress here is that it's not a special education program or approach. So um, for a long time in education, um, you know, we've talked about the tail wagging the dog rather than the dog just functioning on its own. And so um, MTSS is not a gate to a gate. It's not a hoop that you jump through um, uh, to get to special education eligibility. It actually is the opposite. It's actually getting kids what they need when they need it, regardless of labels. So it used to be a long time ago um, when I first entered the field, so I'm showing my age a little bit, that, you know, kids needed to be identified um, as having a learning disability in order to have access to um, sometimes very intensive evidence-based practices. And so we're, we're kind of um, saying that's not the case with multi-tiered systems of support. Every doctor in the hospital has access to really, really great tools and methodologies. The issue is degree of access. So general education teachers um, may not use the tools with all kids to the degree that special ed a special education teacher might, but the point is, is that every Everyone has a common toolkit and common methodologies to pull from. And those methodologies are all evidence-based. Um, there's nothing loosey-goosey or Mickey Mouse in that toolkit. Um, you are getting robust practices across behavior, social, emotional learning, and academics, both reading and math, um, that you're integrating to enhance outcomes for all kids. So this is not a special education approach. It's the opposite. You get accessibility to uh, what kids need, regardless of labels. Um, it's also not a way of avoiding child might find mandates. So um, we are always under uh, child find obligations, whether we're implementing a multi-tiered system of support or not. And that's the whole purpose of um, collecting uh, screening data three times a year at least, which means that um, we are under this surveillance system by law in general education and more so in special education where we are constantly monitoring how all students are doing. So it's similar to going to the doctor once a year, except in, in, in the area of reading, because we're talking about reading today, we go to the doctor three times a year to see how our reading skills are developing. Um, that is a way um, for us to identify 
uh, those students minimally um, who might be starting to fall below what we call benchmark status. They might be getting to be off track. So this is not a way of avoiding child fine mandates. Uh, we don't say, oh, we're implementing a multi-tiered system of support, we're good. Um, we, are, we are constantly on the hunt for students who are pr proving to be more vulnerable and who may need more than what we can provide in general education, as good as that is. Um, we also, um, uh, this is not a system of supports and services that rest solely on the shoulders of classroom teachers. So uh, we talk a lot about what is the goal of classroom instruction. And the goal is to get, to provide instruction that results in at least one year of growth. So that means if I come to my classroom teacher at let's say the 50th percentile of reading achievement, by the end of my second or third grade year with her or him, I should stay at the 50th percentile of achievement. That's what a year's worth of growth means, except that for vulnerable students, we need to get more than a year's worth of growth. And uh, can some classroom teachers get more than a year's worth of growth for some kids? Sure. But is that hard to do? Yes. And it's why you need multiple tiers and other practitioners to help get what we call catch-up growth. So the whole point of a three-tiered system is to at least get a year's worth of growth through good, high-quality core reading instruction, because we're talking about reading today, and and then more growth, catch up growth, um, to close the gap for those kids who are proving to be more vulnerable when it comes to reading acquisition. So I hope that makes sense. That's why there are multiple tiers in the system so that all the practitioners in the hospital, general practitioners, ear, nose and throat doctors, and to some extent neurosurgeons, and that's what you all are, are working uh, collectively and synergistically to get, to get that growth and to give kids what they need um, each day until they don't need it anymore. And then finally, um, this initiative really is about all students. So we talk about um, this student, be, uh, this initiative being um, appropriate for kids who are in the gifted program. We're also wanting to accelerate those kids. We're talking about kids who have already been identified. Uh, they're spending most of their time in the general education hospital. So we're constantly thinking about uh, their needs and including them. We're thinking about English learners. So it really is about uh, all kids. It is an every ed um, initiative. So let me just keep moving here. Uh, this is a graphic that we just created um, that just shows you the components of this comprehensive school improvement framework. So you don't just see, for example, the tiered intervention piece. You see a lot more than that that goes into comprehensive school improvement. So you see standards line core instruction, which is the heart of a multi-tiered system of support. You see universal screening, which we do at every level of the system. Secondary looks a little bit different, but at elementary, it looks pretty much the same. We're, we're monitoring math and reading skill development at least three times times a year for all students, and then more often for students who are showing vulnerability. We are looking at shared ownership. So it's not about my class of kids versus your class of kids. Um, or they go to the reading specialist and we have no idea what's happening there, that everyone is owning and sharing uh, in the outcomes for kids um, uh, through shared ownership and leadership. We're talking about database decisions. So does this include teacher judgment, uh, observations that they make every day of kids? It certainly does. It also includes uh, another larger continuum of, of data that we collect. And not all that data is gonna rest on curriculum-based measurements. That is those through that three times a year screening. We also have other data that we collect that's reliable and valid. So we need a continuum of data to make sound decisions about kids. How are all kids doing? Are most kids reaching benchmark on time? Is only 50% of our population reaching benchmark on time? How do we know that besides how they're performing on the benchmark screening? Well, we have all this other data that suggests that, yeah, one in two kids are having a struggle getting to benchmark status on time. So we're going to alter A, B, and C. The point here is that we don't put our eggs in one source of data, that we collect multiple sources of data and we look for that data to converge so that we can make decisions. And that includes the family's uh, input as well. 
And then RTI already mentioned, we use certain methodologies that help us to discern whether children who are more vulnerable are having an adequate or inadequate response to core instruction plus very intensive or more intensive supplemental intervention. We do that, we calculate growth using mastery measures, we calculate growth using rate of improvement, and we calculate growth using student growth percentiles all on their own different days uh, for uh, more intensive professional development in any one of those areas uh, if, you, if you need that. Uh, family engagement, really a cornerstone of uh, a multi-tiered system. Um, we are involving families um, meaningfully um, at all levels of the system, particularly um, if their child is struggling, we're getting them involved um, in setting goals in helping out to the extent that they, they can and want to at home. We're giving them sometimes, in some cases, evidence-based strategies to use. We're showing them the National Center on Improving Literacy, uh, which has a ton of resources for families. So family engagement, really, really critical. Uh, you understand the multiple tiers. These are not set. Uh, multiple tiers represent a continuum um, that's fluid and flexible of increasingly intensive supports and services. So yeah, we've demarcated tiers one, two, and three. Tier one, all students. Tier two, some students. Tier three, a few students. But in terms of the supports and services, we all want to have access to that continuum of supports and services that we use in different increments um, across these three tiers at the elementary level. And then finally, professional learning. Um, it'll be difficult to sustain um, a viable and or effective multi-tiered system of support without ongoing context embedded professional development. And you, you all can call that a PLC, you can call that um, you know, coming to a training and enacting a practice. It can look like many different things, um, but it does mean taking the knowledge and starting to gradually try it out um, at the classroom level and at the intervention level and keep refining it toward uh, what we would call fidelity of implementation. So this is a lot, and it's not surprising that our school improvement outcomes or effect sizes nationally, um, you know, continue to be um, in the what we call the lower range, um, because putting these things in the fire in a complex system full of people and, you know, different lenses and, and different experiences, um, that's hard to do. And so the challenge is for leadership um, at the highest level, the central office level, to have this common thread through building down to the people who are doing the work every day, for that to be a, a really tight um, system of trust and um, uh, to get people what they need, um, including opportunities like today, and particularly the tools that are gonna help them do their jobs more effectively. So this is tough stuff, but it can be done. And uh, right now in Pennsylvania, I think we have really close to about 75% um, of elementary schools engaged in implementing and working toward fidelity of their multi-tiered system of support. And their focus initially is on prevention of early reading difficulties and then scaling that to the middle school level. So that's really exciting. And, and we're seeing a growing number um, really exponentially actually of middle and high schools moving in the direction too, because they wanna continue with the supports and services that you're offering at the elementary level. Uh, this is just some of our data. It's in the PowerPoint for you to look at. Um, this is just basically to say that the teams who participate in these year-long endeavors really do realize um, improved outcomes and they feel good about their efforts and they feel good about the system that they're building. So um, that's just really from our teams and, and the data that they've collected um, to showcase what they've done. Um, and then finally, before I turn it over to, to Karen, you know, many of you have been exposed to um, information around equity and equitable access. And um, I'm just here to kind of underscore that multi-tiered systems of support from their very beginnings have been concerned about moral imperative, meaning that this idea that all kids should have access to what they need when they need it, um, no matter. And uh, that's what a multi-tiered system of support is. 
is. It's designed to be that fluid and flexible that everyone has access to the tools and methodologies that they need um, to give kids what they need in increasingly intensive doses. So that's why it's called a service delivery framework for that reason. Um, and it really is predicated on equitable access. And if you want more information on equity, uh, because you, you want to get better at that, or, or you feel that maybe you're struggling in that area, uh, PDE has really worked very hard on building out this equity resource hub. So you can click on uh, that link and you can see all the um, resources that they have, anywhere from checklists or things that facilitate dialogue, uh, all the way to actual tools. And so it's, it's a great uh, hub um, to, again, kind of keep uh, at your fingertips uh, for use as you move forward. So um, Karen, I think we're ready now to um, kind of turn it over to you and move into um, folks kind of looking at this fidelity tool and thinking about um, what we just reviewed, if, that, if you're ready. Absolutely. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. I am just going to put this PA Fidelity tool in the chat for your um, consideration. Um, the PA Fidelity tool has just been updated as a way for school teams to evaluate their systems and to set goals for themselves based on what they think is going well and what do they think that might need um, some areas of improvement. So we are going to get ready to go into our first breakout room session today. Uh, please note to our teams, we're not able to accommodate um, having teams in a breakout room today. We do appreciate your understanding on this with uh, the 413 folks. We cannot manually put everybody in breakout rooms, but you're going to get an opportunity to really dive into this PA's Fidelity tool, which is the purpose um, of today's um, interaction. And then you'll also be able to have the opportunity to meet as a team to evaluate your own individual team system. So I'm going to ask you to please take a picture of this slide um, because we are going to be going into breakout rooms and you want to have your um, the directions handy so you know what to do when we get into your breakout room. So I do see some people with their cell phones taking a picture of that slide and that's that's very um, very um, I very much appreciate that. So the directions for the breakout room are to go to the PA Fidelity tool. You'll see the link um, is in the chat. Um, also linked to the uh, PowerPoint if you happen to have downloaded that as well. The second step would be to choose one component below to review as a uh, breakout room. So you can see that there are eight components going from PA, high quality core instruction, universal screening, share ownership, database decision-making, response intervention, family engagement, eligibility determination for SLD and professional learning. So there's eight different ones. So in your group, you wanna maybe just take a quick little vote with your fingers and choose um, you know, which area you wanna just kind of dive into to get familiar with the, uh, the tool. And then think about when you're deciding on which um, area, and just think about your own system and share with the folks in the breakout room what's going well, and then also what would be, you know, some common areas of improvement. Okay, so you might wanna choose an area that in your building you feel might be more of a challenge and the components on the slide and are also in the tool so to help you with that. So without further ado, uh, we have about 50 breakout rooms or uh, thinking about 10 to 11 people per room. Uh, there may not be a whole lot of time for introductions in that 10 minute breakout room, um, but go ahead and pick up vote one through eight and then decide which um, item that you really wanna dive into. So I'm, uh, when you go into a breakout room, you, uh, you will have the ability to unmute. I know one of our colleagues here are going to give you that capability so you can unmute and chat. Um, appreciate everyone in this activity. So I'm going to go ahead and create breakout rooms now. I am opening all rooms here and um, folks, um, maybe my facilitators can tell me, um, are we moving forward in that direction? All participants can unmute themselves, Karen. That's awesome. I'm wondering, um, they're not going into breakout rooms. I'm wondering if we have 50 breakout rooms. 
I've not Joel? gone into a breakout room, Karen. Okay, I think everybody is back now. Um, hopefully you had a chance to dabble with that tool and that you would find that to be helpful for when you go back with your school teams, either the summer or into the fall to evaluate what areas of a multi-tiered system of support are going really well and what are areas that we might need to evaluate um, a, a little bit more or a little bit further in um, your implementation efforts. So thank you for engaging into that breakout room. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more, Jen, if we can move to the next slide. Great. I wanna talk a little bit um, more about moving toward an integrated tiered system of support. So having an integrated tiered system means establishing a seamless system of integrated evidence-based academic behavior, and social emotional practices. And that's ultimately where we want to be. And if you notice in the graphic on the left-hand side, I know it's a little small, there's the triangle. We used to just have academic on one side and behavior on the other, but we also add, added recently the social emotional learning pieces um, to our logo and then also into our training and technical assistance um, and our integration within our multi-tiered system of support initiative. We know that it's very typical for schools to focus on reading and then progress to math and then think about PBIS and or cell outcomes. Or maybe your team started with a PBIS uh, approach and then you added your academics and other pieces as well. However, eventually teams do consolidate their expertise and unique training and become increasingly more sophisticated relative to their ability to be more efficient. So more efficient with integrating academic behavioral and cell data in order to inform building level, universal efforts and um, efforts um, problem solving around individual students. So some teams will just pull up their literacy data or other team might pull up their math data and another team might pull up their behavioral data. But what we're looking for starting with data analysis is that we're integrating those data pieces, putting up those literacy data and our behavior data and, and, and cell data and looking to see um, where those data intersect and to determine how our system is doing, how our grade level is doing, how our classrooms are doing. And then when we get to the tier three problem solving piece, how our individual students are doing with academics, behavior and social emotional learning. We know that students who have difficulty with academics might act out in their behavior and may not feel really good about themselves or if we have students that are ex expressing behavior um, problems, may not be, be paying attention um, and doing well with their academics. And again, might not feel very good about themselves. So they're interwoven and linked. And so that is why we are moving towards that integrated tiered system of support, looking at all those areas of the MTSS triangle. So we want all of our feelings, our actions and our thoughts to work in concert so pulling all of those indicators together to help us to evaluate student engagement as a whole and then at the most finite, finite level, which is the individual student. So if tiered systems are intended to improve that academic behavioral and cell outcomes for all students, we should be aggregating those data sources so that we can that can happen and look at multiple domains, not just literacy, not just math, not just behavior, but integrating all of those things at the system level, the grade level, the classroom level, and the individual level. So we can go to the next slide, Jen. So Jen mentioned earlier that a tiered system of support is akin to a continuous improvement um, cycle. And it is a recursive process. Um, and a multi-tiered system of support 
Um, we never truly arrive where we're constantly reevaluating where we are. And that tool is gonna to be really helpful whether you're just um, at the innovation stages of implementation or you're more of an expert at this point. We don't really evolve. So please take a look at that implementation tool to continuously help you to evaluate where you are. So we're, you're gonna be doing a program evaluation that really never ends at the school level, the system level, um, at the grade level and the student level. So if you look at the top of this uh, graphic, you'll see what is the problem or what do we need? And then we're going to look, um, continue on that circle or that cycle. And we're gonna ask, what are we going to do differently to address that need? Do we do it in a reasonable period of time and then use a continuum of data sources to determine whether it worked or not? In the case of our um, ELO teams, um, you are experiencing this um, with the uh, implementation of our ECRI practices. We want to get all of our students to proficiency in, let's just say, our first grade by spring. Um, and that is our, our problem is that our current efforts have not resulted in this outcome. So you're going to use ECRI practices within core and supplemental reading instruction and intervention. You're going to implement that uh, ECRI and other um, supports with fidelity. And then you're going to look at student growth percentiles from fall to winter and your progress monitoring data to determine, did it work? Okay. And if we did better than when we did in the prior years from fall to winter. So we are in a problem solving at the system, problem solving at the grade level and classroom, and we're problem solving at the student level. So this is the continuous problem solving process that you're going to go to. So next slide, we are going to, before we can move forward as implementers as effective of effective practices, going through that problem solving process, we need to have layers of teams and ensure that the right people are on the right teams. So we want to give you the opportunity to review this document that provides a nice exemplar of teaming structures and their functions across the tiers. So I'm going to ask you again to please take a picture of this slide with your phone and review the green questions. So we are going to do breakout rooms again if we can do that successfully. And we are going to, you're, I'm going to put this uh, link right in the chat right now so that you have it. So as I'm talking about it, you can uh, pull that up and take a peek at it. So if you click on that link, you'll see that there are three columns. And you're going to evaluate, are your teams in place? Are the right people on the right teams? And are your teams serving the designated function? So Jen pulled that up. You have three different uh, basic teams here, universal leadership team, targeted level team, and intensive level team. And there's also the grade level department level teams that you see up there in blue. Oh, you so we're gonna, be, so we're gonna be asking you to please um, evaluate that in your breakout room. And we're going to give you, I yeah, believe, yeah. Uh, five to six minutes to look at that and just kind of discuss about those teams that you have here. All right, we're gonna try now to um, move to those breakout rooms. I'm going to now see if we can um, recreate those rooms. And let's see if we can get those uh, rooms up a little bit. Coming back from the... So as you're coming back from the breakout rooms, I know that we don't have everybody back yet, but you're welcome in the chat to just uh, reflect on your conversations on building a team. Um, are your teams in place? Are the right people on the right teams? And are your teams serving the, des the designated function? If just any reflections that you want to share from your breakout room, you can go ahead and put in the chat. As you're coming back from the breakout room, if you have any reflections from your conversations around um, teaming structures, go ahead and put them in the chat.
sounds like there's some conversation about frequency of, of these teaming structures. There's a question about the problem solving flipbook. Uh, note this is a great resource for teams to use. Some of us don't have teams um, that, and time seems to be a barrier. Um, one of the things that somebody suggested is that having a schedule ahead of time in place can help with those barriers. Um, we, meeting weekly for intensive teams seems to be a, um, a little bit of a time constraint for folks. Okay. Some folks are finding this to be helpful and some of the folks um, seem to think that it might, bullet points could be um, minimized time and substitutes, right? So there are barriers to those. So I think what's really important, especially for that uh, grade level, department level or building level MTSS team would be to work through some of those barriers, come up with schedules for a teaming process ahead of time so that it's not an afterthought, right? And so that we can prepare for those substitutes and those things that uh, provide those challenges for those teaming structures. Yeah, Karen, if I could add on the, the meet at least weekly for the intensive level team, um, that I think that's somewhat confusing. When we think about students who are receiving our most intensive supports, the students who are receiving tier three supports and services, and how often that team gets together with the family member of the student, um, who's getting the tier three supports and services, who may be having an inadequate response to further problem solve, um, including decisions around going to eligibility. Um, that's a team that usually meets um, on a smaller list of students about every four to six weeks. So when they say, meets at least weekly. I think what they're saying is they rotate through um, a list of students who are receiving the most intensive supports and they might allocate time to rotate through that list of students um, on an every four to six week basis. So that I think that's a little bit confusing. But I don't know of anyone uh, in in Pennsylvania at least, who has a tier three problem solving team that sets aside time to talk about the same student every week. Um, but, but every four to six weeks or every five to seven weeks um, after the medicines had some time to sit and you gather some progress monitoring data and other sources of data um, to gauge <clears throat> growth, um, AKA response, I mean, that, that's what we typically see. So I hope that helps to clarify. Yes, thank you. I think that's a very important point. And in practice, that, that what you said is very practical. So Jen, I'm not sure if you want to move on to the PowerPoint at this point, and I'll uh, start to facilitate the next um, activity. Yep. So we spent a lot of time up to this point um, talking about multi-tiered systems of support, a recursive problem solving process, and then also what do some of the teaming structures look like? So one of the questions that we want to kind of as an anticipatory set to the next section of looking at the evidence um, in the science of reading is in your minds, what are the connections between the science of reading and multi-tiered systems of support? So Jen, if you go to the next slide, I'm going to ask folks now to practice their annotation feature, and actually not practice, but to use their annotation feature again. Remember, if you go up to the view options at the top of your screen and click on annotate, um, you'll see that you have that text feature. So I'd like you to think about uh, what are the connections between the science of reading and MTSS? And we're going to make these connections really explicit in the next couple of minutes but just wanted to think about what are your thoughts? What are the connections between the science of reading and multi-tiered systems of support? Okay, so we have a lot of engagement, right? We, we talk about a, a student engagement being super important. And we know for our EELO teams that using that ECRI is definitely going to include elements of explicit instruction, meeting the needs of all students, Wow. Um, 
using um, all the tiers to ensure we are um, moving towards um, evidence-based practices and getting the outcomes we want. A lot of systematic instruction, evidence-based, coordination between, fidelity at tier one. You can see evidence-based is really big and bold there. Very nice. Yes. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And Jen, when you're ready, um, we'll clear those annotations. If I could have some help from my colleagues with that, um, we will move on to the next thing. Yeah, so just to further elaborate on, on uh, what many of you started to say um, through the annotating is, is that early intervention is effective. And we learned that through um, years and years and years of early prevention studies in both reading and behavior. So you remember Karen was talking about the different sides of the triangle and um, might just be helpful to Go back to the triangle. So um, when we look at the triangle, the triangle represents um, certainly the domains that we all have. You know, we all have a cognitive domain. It's it's called academics here. We have a behavioral domain, and we have a social emotional domain. Um, so that makes the up up the whole child, or or um, you know, us as human beings. But on this, the, the two sides of the triangle were initially labeled academics and behavior for a reason, and that's because they represent um, high incidence problems um, among what's called the general populace. That just means that are there things that become sort of human health crises if we don't take care of them early? And if, if we know what to do, you know, should we start enacting that into practice and, and taking care of it? So um, reading and also um, behavioral health, math um, to a lesser extent uh, for different reasons, but definitely reading and definitely behavioral health issues are considered to be high incidence problems, but preventative. Um, among the general populace. And then you kind of say, well, what's high incidence? You know, what, what's so high incidence that it's kind of epidemic-like and leads to um, lots of problems um, uh, if they're not treated early and effectively, uh, much like medical conditions. If they're not treated early and effectively, they can, they can cause um, a, lot of, a lot of problems for lots of people long-term. So, um, uh, when we talk about what's high incidence, reading um, as a low estimate is difficult for about one in three children. Um, one in three children or more um, really struggle with early reading acquisition if they're not provided with very explicit instruction. Behavioral health is also similar. Um, about one in four kids pretty early on um, have a tendency to develop what we call long-term intrinsic conditions and or long-term extrinsic conditions. On the intrinsic side, we have things like anxiety and depression um, being withdrawn. And then on the other side, uh, we have things like uh, oppositional defiant behavior, aggression, um, things that are external in nature. So behavioral health conditions and reading um, skill development are both considered high incidence um, challenges or difficulties among the general population. And so to curb them or to prevent them or to mitigate them and reduce them from one in three or one in four uh, walking people down to almost non-existent, you have what's called this multi-tiered system of support. But what fueled the multi-tiered system of support was this notion of um, setting up this hospital to be really strong, but adding layers of um, supports that would um, help the hospital um, 
do even better. And so those are the extra interventions that we talk about at tiers two and or tier three particularly. So when we looked at the early prevention studies that were carried out by NICHD um, uh, a long time ago, um, more than 30 years ago, what they found is, is that um, most children were able to learn to read um, when provided <clears throat> with good core instruction, <clears throat> excuse me, plus um, supplemental intervention. And these were the more specific studies that showed um, what happened after the children received enhanced core reading instruction plus some amount of supplemental intervention um, during uh, the average day or week um, throughout the year. And so you can see um, at the top, it says that the children included in the study were all kids who were performing on typically a standardized measure below what we call the 30th percentile of achievement, which is the threshold that kind of predicts who's going to go on to be a, a, a proficient reader and who's not. So we know that if we can get all kids to at least this 30th percentile of reading achievement, as measured by reliable and valid measures, they are usually going to be okay when it comes to developing um, on their path toward reading proficiency. But those who fall under that threshold, um, we worry about, uh, unless we're going to be doing supplemental intervention for them. And then it has to be the right kind of supplemental intervention. But this study looked at that population. And they looked at, um, if you can follow my cursor here, um, in this study, for example, with Foreman, there were 35% of the kids in that particular area um, or sample that were falling below the 30th percentile, and they implemented with those kids, on average, about 174 hours of enhanced classroom core reading instruction. And the difference um, after they received the 174 hours, just by enhancing what was done through the classroom at the classroom level, resulted in only 6% of the kids continuing to fall below the 30th percentile. So in essence, just focusing on classroom level, um, which we said is typically not the case that in a tiered system of support, it doesn't fall just solely on the classroom teachers. We, we help out through tiered providers doing advanced tier supports, but in this study, just doing that alone um, reduced the, the population of kids who are performing, continue to perform below that threshold down from 35% from of the kids to 6%. Um, in Felton's study, uh, they did 340 hours of supplemental intervention in groups of eight with, um, in their population, there were 32% of the kids identified as falling below the 30th percentile reading achievement. And after 340 hours in groups of eight, they reduced that to only 5% of the kids uh, continuing to fall below the 30th percentile. So like this, when we look over here at the post-treatment response, this is these are the groups of kids that we would say in, in our world, when we talk about RTI, are having an inadequate RTI. Most of the kids, are responding 80% or better of the sample um, of all these kids who are underachieving are responding to this extra amount of instruction and intervention. And then we have a small subset of these kids um, who, who are proving to have an inadequate response. Um, but when most of the kids are responding, that shows fidelity of what's happening. That this 174 hours of robusting up the classroom treatment um, there was fidelity there because it worked for many of these kids who otherwise would have continued to underachieve if it, if it hadn't been provided. Same thing for the groups of eight that worked for the majority of kids. And the reason I'm saying this um, is because when you think about what you are currently providing, uh, whether a reading specialist or, or somebody else at the advanced tier level, you wanna be looking for the same response to give you feedback on fidelity of advanced tier supports. And fidelity of tier, advanced tier support certainly looks like time allocated, but it also looks at the methodology that you're using. And it also looks at um, the number of responses children uh, are able to have in a certain amount of intervention periods. It looks at a whole number of factors. And so you'll know if you're on target, if about 80% of your kids who are receiving your advanced tier support are responding. And you'll know that because they will be growing uh, each week um, 
exponentially, really. Um, they will be they will be doubling their growth prior to um, having worked with you. So we're asking advanced tiered providers to kind of look at this and say, yeah, I, I want the same numbers. When I get a group of five kids together and I'm giving an advanced tier support, I want four out of the five um, to you know work toward functioning above this 30th percentile threshold. And your progress monitoring data and other sources of data will help you to gauge whether that's happening. If only 50% of your kids are responding to the treatment that you're offering, there's probably room to problem solve around how to improve um, the intensity of the instruction, the fidelity of the instruction, and the same applies to the classroom level. Um, Valutino, who's well known um, in the scientific reading community, um, in his study, uh, the 46% of the kids who were identified um, as needing intervention because of their performance below the 30th percentile of achievement received on average somewhere between 35 and 65 hours of intervention and it was one-on-one -on -one. and you can see what a difference that made. <clears throat> Only 7% of the kids in that 46% um, sample um, did not respond or had an inadequate response to the one-on-one -on -one tutor, tutoring uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 65 hours. Torgerson, who's also well known uh, in the field, um, looked at studies where they also did one-on-one -on -one tutoring, or in this case, uh, what we call tier three, which is typically a one to three recommended ratio, one provider to about three students. Um, and they were in the neighborhood of, of 80 to 88 hours of uh, intervention or uh, whatever they provided here, they're calling it tutoring. And um, again, substantially reduced um, uh, the number of kids um, who continue to fall you know, below the, the threshold for um, predicting uh, future proficiency. So in all of these studies, what you can see is that in addition to core reading instruction, supplemental intervention did make a marked difference in getting what we call that catch-up growth or that acceleration. And what's interesting here is you could look at 340 hours and say, wow, that's that's a lot, and it is, in groups of eight. Um, or you can look at um, this, you know, on the low end, 35 hours in a one-to-one -one and say, you know, well, that might be more manageable, but it's it's one-to-one. -one. But in every situation, uh, no matter what the amount or duration was, there was a substantial um, improvement in reading skills for at-risk kids. So um, that's where the tiered system comes from, that if we do our best to really bolster what's happening during the 90 minutes of core reading instruction with small group in there provided by the classroom teacher, particularly with the vulnerable kids, focusing on um, issues or targeted areas that kids need to clean up, and then that's reinforced outside of the classroom through supplemental intervention for a reasonable period of time and a reasonable group size, we can prevent reading problems and or mitigate early reading skill deficiencies for all but about four to roughly four to seven percent of the population. So do we have the answers for all kids at this juncture? Um, not for every single kid, but do we have them for about 95 to 96 percent of kids? Yes, and it's why the charge to our teams who are focused on K-1 primarily, um, reading instruction and intervention within a tiered system is to get 100% of kids to benchmark um, by spring. So it's because it's, it's an attainable goal if you've got an operative um, tiered system and you've got the right continuum of, you know, again, evidence-based practices or what we call those pharmaceutical interventions. So you're going to need tools, you're going to need practices that are really robust. And um, if you look more closely at these studies, you can see the kinds of things that they did with the kids. Um, the bottom line is they all came down to explicit instruction um, because that is what has worked for a very, very long time. And so explicit instruction is, uh, I would say almost always, uh, I have never actually not seen it, be embedded um, within very, very effective practices, um, core level and supplemental intervention level. 
So how can you prevent early reading failure? And we, we're just coming back to how we started, which is, you know, one of the things you want to make sure you have is that in your arsenal are sensitive and valid screening measures. So some of the things that we use are not always sensitive to incremental growth um, in phonological awareness or in phonics or in fluency or in accuracy of reading. And so you want to make sure when it comes to early reading skill acquisition that you have have reliable and valid measures because you're making pretty high stakes decisions about which kids should stay in a tier three and continue to get a tier three support, which kids um, maybe need to go on to eligibility determination, how you're using resources. Um, lots of those things uh, that I just mentioned are, are things that you are, are there, they're, if you're going to go on to eligibility determination, that's a really big decision. It's a big decision in a child's life and for a family. So I want to make sure that our, our screening measures and every other measure that we use um, are, are sensitive and valid. You want to make sure you continue to secure PD. So if there's anything we said today that you're not quite sure about, you know, if I said student growth percentiles and you were questioning what in the world that was and whether that's in the current data system that you have, um, make sure you reach out um, to your school psychologist or your IU consultant, someone who can help um, you better understand what that means in this world um, relative to making some of these decisions, not just for all kids, um, uh, but in particular for vulnerable kids. And then uh, implement and sustain a three-tiered model. So using the fidelity uh, checklist that you just took, took a look at and doing that within your team, within your context. You know, you were with other people from other schools today and um, uh, we had to do that because of numbers. But the, the ideal uh, situation would be to use that tool on a frequent basis to keep reevaluating where you are relative to where you'd like to be. And that is 100% of kids at the K-1 level reach benchmark and reach, reach proficiency, this minimum level to set them up um, for success moving forward um, uh, academically, behaviorally, and otherwise. And then continually assess student progress. So uh, for those stu students who are, who are just starting to fall below benchmark, that is they need um, to receive a tier two or their function is significantly below average range. They need to have a tier three support and service those are kids we want to monitor pretty frequently to assess their response. And their response is either going to be adequate or inadequate. And your problem solving team um, will decide then what next steps are. Um, and you'll choose from a range of steps depending on uh, what's happening. And then cultivate school leadership and build internal capacity. So um, what we want to see is that in any multi-tiered system of support, what we want to hear is um, in response to, for example, this question, who's the best person um, for Jen who has, let's say, a, a phonics skill problem? Um, who's the best person for Jen to get phonics, really, really powerful phonics instruction from? And what we want you to refrain from is identifying, you know, one expert in the building um, who loves to do explicit phonics instruction. What we want you to say is that all of our teachers, classroom, reading specialists, ESL providers, the list goes on and on. Everyone has access to um, uh, the knowledge and the tools and the skills to be able to provide really robust instruction. And so Jen could go to anybody um, because they're all really, really good. And that's what you want your, your hospital to kind of look at. All the doctors are well prepared, they're well equipped, they have a range of tools to solve a range of issues, and um, they do it uh, with most of the patients that come in the door. So um, going back to kind of pulling this full circle, uh, what you heard in the video um, was that we change what we give because we're not able to change what comes through the door. That's who's coming to you. Some of you have a greater concentration of needs than others, um, and we get that. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, that you, you can't uh, do prevention and treatment of early reading um, acquisition effectively and sustain it over time. You absolutely can. And we've seen so many schools do it uh, over and over and over. So um, those are good schools to get in touch with, by the way. And uh, if you go to our website and you look at our RTI SLD approved um, list of schools, um, you can reach out to them and, and get a sense. Um, you can also look in the live binder at the number of teams who participated in this series um, over the past 
um, probably four or five years worth of teams now in the live binder. And you could contact those schools too, if you just wanna hear from you know, actual teachers, actual reading specialists and other administrators. So finally, just wanna leave you with some resources and um, all of these resources are, are noteworthy uh, for different reasons. Um, we mentioned enhanced core reading instruction that would give you a deeper dive into what it is we mean by that, uh, what it is these routines look like, sound like, and feel like. Um, University of Florida Literacy Institute ha is replete with lessons, tools, resources, all done for you across the building blocks. Um, and they've done just a great job and all of them are free. So we'd, we'd encourage you to check out that. The National Center on Improving Literacy is meant to be a one-stop shop for families, administrators, and teachers. And there's also a kid zone where you can be prescriptive um, with children and with their families on activities you'd want to prescribe that they work on and do outside of school. Um, you can also prescribe these activities in school um, if kids have access to um, uh, computers and, and a way to, to access the activities. But the National Center on Improving Literacy is all about um, enhancing literacy outcomes, and they have a particular focus on, on kids who are vulnerable or kids who are struggling. Uh, lots of information on dyslexia policy across the country and on dyslexia um, in general. And uh, I believe um, Jeannie Hertzler, who'll be presenting a little bit later, will be showing you um, ENSOL. Um, and then finally, the National Center on Intensive Intervention is, if you will, um, a center that focuses uh, largely on helping you with um, the tenants and the practices um, that are inherent in multi-tiered systems of support. So NCII has been around for a while. Uh, there are progress monitoring resources there. There are evidence-based practices that have been um, studied, uh, not only in reading, but there are options for behavior and there are options for mathematics. Um, and that center is a K to 12 um, center. Lots of, lots of videos and in and of itself, you could just do, get all of your PD, from NCII. Um, the same applies to the National Center on Improving Literacy. So much PD there um, for, for you and, and for families. So those are our recommended resources. We're going to, uh, besides Patent YouTube and Patents Literacy and MTSS initiatives, um, certainly these are uh, additional state level options. I wanted to show you kind of the national options. And then these are just some state level options. Your intermediate units also um, have uh, lots of resources for you. So um, we hope this initial um, uh, part of the presentation has been helpful. It's just good to lay the groundwork between the connection between multi-tiered systems and the, the science of reading and the prevention of, of early reading difficulties and just treatment of reading uh, and enhancement of reading outcomes in general. So we're going to um, now transition to a break. It is 1025. Oh. We will um, continue on. Well, welcome back for your break. From your break, you are definitely in for a treat. Our next item on the agenda is to take an intentional look at Emily Hanford's "The Science of Learning to Read." She was our keynote, one of our keynotes for our literacy symposium last June, and this was such a powerful keynote that we felt it really deserved a second look. Her message was so timely and addressed the importance of providing equitable opportunities for all students and that they would receive quality literacy instruction. So our goal for our time together is to watch the video and we have two designated um, stopping points where we'll be put in random breakout rooms. At that point, um, we will, um, ask you to discuss um, ask you to discuss what are the some of the things you heard and uh, as you went through. But first as we get started, I want you to grab a sheet of a blank sheet of paper and divide it into four quadrants. So two on the top and two on the bottom. And then um, label what the first one equity and access. The second, um, code-based meaning, um, code-based versus meaning-based. 
then going down in the bottom quadrant, reading is not natural, and then the phonics patch. So I'll give you a minute to do that, and then I'll go on and ten, give you some instructions. Okay, as you're watching the video, just jot down some key takeaways that you have related to these four big ideas so that when we go in, so that when you do get placed into a breakout room, you will have your notes to refer to in your conversation. So without any further ado, we are going to get into our first, our, uh, sorry, the first um, video. My can, screen here. Hello. Can everybody. everyone see that? Okay. I think you can see my screen. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Thank Thank you. You. Thanks, Patton, for having me. Uh, it is an extraordinary moment in our nation's history in so many ways. I, I saw a tweet the other day that said, future historians will be asked which quarter of 2020 they specialize in. Really quite remarkable just how much is going on. I think all of us are being confronted with uh, uncomfortable questions and painful truths. And the bottom line is that it's been time for a very long time for us to do something about the inequalities that are produced and perpetuated by our systems and our institutions, and that includes education. My remarks today are informed by what I've learned as a journalist over the past three and a half years about the science of reading. That is what scientists have figured out about how skilled reading works and what that means about what children need to learn. What I've discovered is a lot of kids are not being taught what they need to know. 65% of fourth graders in this country read at the level considered basic or below 65%. Even more shocking is looking at those numbers by race and family income. Nearly 80% of students from low income families are reading at basic or below. Nearly 80% of Hispanic children and more than 80% of black children, more than 80%. When children struggle with reading early in life, it can translate into big problems later on, behavior issues, depression, anxiety, lower high school graduation rates, fewer opportunities for advanced education, and an increased likelihood of ending up in the criminal justice system. But it really does not have to be this way. So over the past three and a half years, I have read thousands of pages of books, reports, and articles about how skilled reading works, uh, what kids need to learn to become skilled readers, and what's going on in children's struggle to learn how to read. I've talked with hundreds of people, I've visited 10 states so far to try to understand how reading is being taught in schools today. And what I've learned has really shocked me, and it's basically this. Over the past 40 or 50 years, cognitive scientists and psychologists and neuroscientists and linguists and other researchers all over the world have conducted thousands of studies in labs and in classrooms to try to figure out how people read, what children need to learn to become good readers, and what's going on when kids struggle to learn. But this mountain of scientific evidence about reading is not, for the most part, making its way into schools. Many teachers are not being taught this science in their teaching preparation programs. They're not taught this science in professional development they get on the job. In fact, some of what they learn about reading and how to teach it is actually at odds with what the scientific evidence says. Now, I didn't know any of this a few years ago. So today I'm going to tell you the story of what I've learned. So, here we go. So I've been a reporter for 25 years. And I have covered all kinds of things, um, elections, daily news, healthcare. My first job in was covering religion, which is fascinating. And as Pam said, in 2008, I was hired to cover education for this public radio documentary program called American Radio Works. We're now called APM Reports. We're the documentary and investigative reporting group at American Public Media. And in my 12 years of reporting on education, I've been particularly interested in two things how family income generally and poverty in particular affect educational opportunities and outcomes, and also how people learn, the findings from cognitive science and how those play out or not in our classrooms. So almost all of my reporting has been focused on secondary and post-secondary education. That photo of me in the classroom with the little kids was the very first reporting project I did for American Public Media. It was about preschool. But then I didn't do much of anything on early or elementary education until I got interested in reading a few years ago. And that is really when I realized that early reading instruction is where it's at if you are interested in educational equity, opportunity, and how people learn. So this 
Uh, this is the first reporting project that I did about reading back in 2017. I had no idea that I would still be on the same topic three years later. So Hard to Read is a podcast episode and an article about why students with dyslexia have such a hard time getting what they need in school. And it grew out of a project on higher education. I was reporting on the huge number of students who graduate from high school, go on to college, and are told that they need to take remedial classes. Basically, they're paying to do high school over again. One day, I ended up in this hours-long interview with a young woman who had been placed in a remedial English class, and she told me that she had dyslexia. She said she had never been identified with dyslexia as a kid. She told me she didn't get any effective help with her reading problems in school, and she ended up kind of stuck. She was in college now without the reading and writing skills that she needed. So this is what got me interested in learning more about dyslexia. I told you I really knew nothing about it. And I started hearing the same story from parents all over the country, like the exact same story, the same places in the story where the parents would break down in tears and they always break down in tears. Here's how the story goes. My child started school and I knew something wasn't quite right. I went to the kindergarten teacher and she told me, don't worry, make sure you read lots of books to him, everything will be fine. But reading seemed to be really hard for him. He just kind of didn't seem to get it. I went to the first grade teacher and she said, don't worry, all kids learn differently, he'll catch up. But he didn't seem to be making much progress. By second grade, he was avoiding reading. He was telling me he didn't want to go to school. The teacher said, we just haven't found your child the right book yet. It'll all come together in time. And it went on and on like this. The parents saying something's not right. The school saying everything's fine. And the parent not knowing what to do because the schools are the education experts, right? So by now, the mom is thinking, could my child have dyslexia? But when she brings dyslexia up with the school, they tell her, no, no, we don't say that here. We don't use the word dyslexia. Maybe her child is getting pulled out of the classroom for some extra help. Maybe he gets some accommodations, like extra time on tests, maybe some audiobooks. But the boy still does not really learn how to read because he's not taught how to do it. Because the school does not actually know that much about how reading works, which means the school doesn't really know what's going on when a child is struggling to read, and they don't really know quite what to do about it. I took a class on the science of reading last year. Many of my classmates were teachers, and here's what they said about their preparation to teach reading. I didn't feel adequately prepared to teach reading. This is hard for me to admit because I have several degrees and felt like I should know what I was doing. I kept falsely reassuring myself my students weren't making much growth because of this reason or that reason, although deep down I feared it was me and my instruction. I wasn't adequately prepared. It's not that I didn't care, it's that I didn't know any better. And then this. I felt so angry and guilty when I was finally taught the basics of reading science. I thought, how did you let me teach literacy without knowing this? I'm going to explain some of the basics of what I've learned about the reading science in a moment, but first I want to finish the story of that worried mom with struggling reader. Here's what happened. My screen here. Hello, everybody. Okay, let me just same topic three years later. An hours long interview with a young woman who had been placed in a remedial English class and she told me that she had dyslexia. So she said she had never been identified with dyslexia as a kid. She told me she didn't get any effective help with her reading problems in school, and she ended up kind of stuck. She was in college now without the reading and writing skills that she needed. So this is what got me interested in learning more about dyslexia. I told you I really knew nothing about it. And I started hearing the same story from parents all over the country, like the exact same story, the same places in the story where the parents would break down in tears and they always break down in tears. Here's how the story goes. My child started school and I knew something wasn't quite right. I went to the kindergarten teacher and she told me, don't worry, make sure you read lots of books to him, everything will be fine. But reading seemed to be really hard for him. He just kind of didn't seem to get it. I went to the first grade teacher and she said, don't worry, all kids learn differently, he'll catch up. But he didn't seem to be making much progress. By second grade, he was avoiding reading. He was telling me he didn't want to go to school. The teacher said, we just haven't found your child the right book yet. It'll all come together in time. And it went on and on like this. The parents saying something's not right. The school saying everything's fine. And the parent not knowing what to do because the schools are the education experts, right? 
So by now, the mom is thinking, could my child have dyslexia? But when she brings dyslexia up with the school, they tell her, no, no, we don't say that here. We don't use the word dyslexia. Maybe her child is getting pulled out of the classroom for some extra help. Maybe he gets some accommodations, like extra time on tests, maybe some audiobooks. But the boy still does not really learn how to read because he's not taught how to do it. Because the school does not actually know that much about how reading works, which means the school doesn't really know what's going on when a child is struggling to read, and they don't really know quite what to do about it. I took a class on the science of reading last year. Many of my classmates were teachers, and here's what they said about their preparation to teach reading. I didn't feel adequately prepared to teach reading. This is hard for me to admit because I have several degrees and felt like I should know what I was doing. I kept falsely reassuring myself my students weren't making much growth because of this reason or that reason, although deep down I feared it was me and my instruction. I wasn't adequately prepared. It's not that I didn't care, it's that I didn't know any better. And then this. I felt so angry and guilty when I was finally taught the basics of reading science. I thought, how did you let me teach literacy without knowing this? I'm gonna explain some of the basics of what I've learned about the reading science in a moment, but first I wanna finish the story of that worried mom with struggling reader. Here's what happens if she has the time and if she has the money. She takes things into her own hands. She might pay for private testing. That can cost thousands of dollars. She might pay for private tutoring. That can be more thousands of dollars. She might hire an educational consultant or an attorney or both to help her fight for what her child needs in public school. And all of this is not just really expensive. It's exhausting, it's frustrating, and it's really, really hard. And the mother begins to realize her child may never get what he needs in public school. Or anyway, he's not gonna get it fast enough because now he's eight or nine or 10 years old and he really doesn't like school. And he's falling behind on other subjects because he can't read well enough. Maybe he's beginning to act out in school or maybe it's manifesting as depression, anxiety, withdrawal. And maybe her child, eight or nine or 10 years old, has actually said to her, I want to kill myself. I have heard this from a number of parents, little kids who say they want to die because they're struggling to learn how to read. This is when, if she has the resources and the time, the mom pulls her child out of public school. Maybe she homeschools him, or maybe the family figures out a way to come up with the tens of thousands of dollars that it can cost to send the child to a specialized private school if there was a good private school nearby, and that's a big if. At one point I was with a group of moms in a dyslexia advocacy group, and I realized that none of them, not a single one, had their struggling readers in public school anymore. They had all given up on the idea that public schools could help their kids learn how to read, but they were still fighting for other people's children. Here is the situation that we're in in this country. If you can come up with the money to pay for it, you can probably find a way for your struggling reader to be taught how to read. But if you don't have the money and your child is not learning to read in school, what do you do? The equity implications of this are stunning. If you're from a low or even a moderate income family, there is no safety net, there's no backup if you're not being taught to read in school. As one mom put it to me, getting help for a struggling reader is a rich man's game. Reading, the most basic, most fundamental skill, is a rich man's game how did that happen and how is it allowed to continue? That's what led me to the next reporting project called Hard Words. So this is a podcast episode and article about core reading instruction. So not what needs to be done for struggling readers in particular, but rather what do all children need to learn to become good readers? The bottom line from decades of scientific research is this. What kids with dyslexia need to learn to become good readers is not substantially different from what all people need to learn to become good readers. Kids with dyslexia may need a more intense dose of a certain kind of instruction, but all kids can benefit from the kind of instruction that kids with dyslexia desperately need. So hard words focus quite a bit on phonics instruction, and it focused on phonics instruction for two big reasons. One, Phonics has been the focus of so much debate and controversy for years, centuries. When people are arguing about reading, they're usually fighting about phonics. Two, I focused on phonics because what scientists have discovered is that phonics skills are critical when it comes to becoming a good reader. So why is that? 
because the starting point for reading is sound. What a child has to figure out to become a good reader is that the words that she hears and knows how to say are made up of speech sounds. Those are phonemes. And she has to understand that in an alphabetic language like English, phonemes are represented by letters and combinations of letters. So that's like the alphabetic principle. It's something that human beings have to learn. It doesn't come naturally. Learning to read is not like learning to speak. So if you immerse a child in an environment of spoken language, unless she has a hearing problem or some other severe impairment, she is going to learn to speak her native language. That's not the case with reading. Immersing children in a literate environment is not enough. We aren't born with brains that are wired to read. Learning to read is not a natural process. That's one of the big takeaways from the scientific research on reading. And why aren't we born wired to read? Because reading is kind of new. Human beings invented written language just a few thousand years ago, which is really recently in the course of evolutionary history. So children need to be taught how their written language works. Some children need very little instruction, but some children need quite a lot. So many of you have probably seen this and I, you're gonna hear from Nancy or maybe you already did. So this slide was made by Nancy Young and it compiles estimates from a number of studies and it basically, it shows that about, no one knows for sure, but roughly 40% of kids are gonna learn to read no matter how you teach them. So a little bit of instruction and immersion in a literate environment, which is important, that's probably going to do the job for about 40% of kids. But most children, right, more than half, are not going to learn to read well unless they're explicitly taught how their written language works. And some kids are going to need a lot of instruction. So a key thing for everyone to understand is that all kids can benefit from explicit instruction. Even those kids who may not need it to be able to make sense of text, can become better readers and better spellers if they're taught how their written language works. So what I tried to explain in hard words is why phonics instruction matters so much. Good phonics instruction does not equal good reading instruction. No one who knows the scientific research says that or advocates for that. But schools that are not teaching phonics in a direct and systematic way are not giving all kids a fair shot at becoming good readers. Australian researchers Anne Kessels and Jennifer Buckingham summed it up this way in an article. They wrote, when children begin school, we cannot predict with sufficient accuracy which children will struggle to learn to read without explicit systematic phonics instruction and which will not. Therefore, the most ethical and prudent action is to provide all children with the most effective teaching methods based on the best available evidence, thereby accelerating the progress of all children and minimizing the likelihood that any child will struggle to learn to read. Again, no one is arguing that phonics instruction is all children need to become good readers. There is much more to the science of reading than just phonics. There always has been. In fact, one of the primary questions for reading scientists when the field began to establish back in the 1970s was, what is the role of decoding and reading? And what else do people need to be able to do to comprehend what they read? So a good place to begin Many of you have probably seen this. This is the simple view of reading. Some of you probably know this a lot better than I do. The simple view was first proposed in 1986 by research researchers Philip Goff and William Tummer. They proposed this model because they were trying to clarify the role of decoding in reading comprehension. Everyone agrees that the goal of reading is to comprehend text. The question is, how does a little kid get there? The simple view says that reading comprehension is the product of two things. One is your ability to decode words. So you see the letter string R-E-A-D-I-N-G, and you know that that string of letters represents the word reading. The other part of the equation is your language comprehension. That's your ability to understand spoken language. So we're not talking about your ability to read text. Language comprehension is your ability to understand meaning when someone is talking or when text is being read out loud to you. So for example, when someone says to you, she is reading the book, you know what the verb means in that sentence. You know what she's doing. <laughs> the simple view says that if you have really good language comprehension, but zero decoding skills, your reading comprehension will be zero because zero times anything is zero. The simple view also says that if you have really good decoding skills, but very poor language comprehension, you just don't know the meaning of that many words in spoken language, your reading comprehension is not gonna be very good either. So here's that, how this applies to learning how to read. Most kids entering school have very little when it comes to the decoding part of the equation. 
they have zero or close to zero when it comes to the D in the simple view of reading. But they do have something when it comes to the language comprehension part of the equation. In other words, when children enter school, they know the meaning of lots of words, but they don't know how to decode those words yet. This is why people familiar with the science of reading call for an emphasis on phonics instruction in the early grades. Because if the goal is to get to reading comprehension and you have a bunch of five and six year olds before you with language comprehension skills, but virtually no decoding skills, what do you do, need to do to help those children get to reading comprehension? You need to help those children develop decoding skills. What you want to focus on with beginning readers is getting their decoding skills up to the level of their language comprehension. Now, the simple view clearly shows that focusing only on decoding would be a very big mistake because that's only half the equation. And as everyone knows, kids come into school with very different language comprehension skills. Some kids know the meaning of lots and lots of words. Some kids have far smaller vocabularies. So reading instruction that aligns with the simple view has to focus on the language comprehension part of the equation too. So this includes lessons and activities that expand children's oral vocabularies. I was in a first grade classroom in Oakland, California, where reading instruction was deliberately aligned with the simple view. So what I saw was explicit phonics instruction in one part of the reading instruction with kids broken into small groups, depending on the level of their decoding skills. And kids were not just being taught skills, they were given lots of time to practice the skills they learned by reading books. And another part of the reading instruction was explicit vocabulary lessons and lots of reading aloud by the teacher. So the words that the kids had learned were posted on cards all over the classroom. It was near the end of the year, so they were starting to cover the windows. And they included words like extraordinary, gigantic, neighborly, and ridiculous. So those are not words that the vast majority of first grades are gonna be able to decode, and they shouldn't be expected to. But the first graders in this class were learning the pronunciation and meaning of these words so that when they're able to read them, they'll know what the words mean. By the way, every single child in this class spoke a language other than English at home, and many of them, for many of them, English was actually their third language. So the simple view was proposed as a theoretical model back in 1986, and the basics of this model have been confirmed by research over and over again since. And I think the simple view is really helpful because it disentangles some of the stuff that is most contentious in the debates about reading. In what's known as the whole language view and in the balanced literacy view more recently, but the focus right from the start of reading instruction should be on getting kids to focus on the meaning of what they're reading. So whole language and balanced literacy are meaning emphasis approaches to reading instruction, as opposed to what's known as a code emphasis approach, which emphasizes decoding skills at the beginning of reading instruction. So early reading instruction that aligns with science is a code emphasis approach so that kids can get to meaning. Everyone agrees that meaning's the goal. The question again is, how does a little kid get there? So this is Scarborough's rope, Pam mentioned. I'm sure all of you know this rope, and if you didn't before the beginning of this uh, conference, you do now. So it's, it's sort of another model for understanding how skilled reading works. Uh, Hollis Scarborough is a psychologist in Haskins Labs, and she's been studying reading development since the 1980s. So Scarborough's rope helps unpack what goes into each side of the equation put forth in the simple view. So the upper strand is language comprehension. This model shows that language comprehension is complex. It's not just all the words you know the meaning of an oral language, it's also your level of knowledge. It's the stuff you know. It's your understanding of how language works, language structure, grammar, uh, your ability to make inferences, understand things like metaphors. So this is sort of a more nuanced explanation of what goes into the language comprehension part of the simple view equation. And it can help teachers understand what might be going on when kids are decoding well, but they're still struggling with reading comprehension. Very often, they have some kind of language comprehension issue. The lower strand of Scarborough's rope is the word recognition strand. So like the simple view of reading, Scarborough's rope shows that without good word recognition skills, you're not going to become a very good reader. And the rope unpacks the various skills and abilities that go into word recognition. So you can see that one element is decoding. That's basically your phonics knowledge. Do you have a good understanding of how letters and combinations of letters represent the sounds in words? Teaching students the basic letter sound combinations in the English language gives them access to successfully sounding out more than 80% of the words in English print. But that's not all the words. Children need more than just phonics knowledge to be successful with written English. 
So I think it's more useful. This is a term I used earlier. It's more useful to think about teaching children how their written language works because English spelling is not just based on the sounds and words. English is a morphophonemic language, meaning our spelling patterns are based on both sounds and meanings. So to really understand English spelling, kids should be taught some morphology. In other words, they need to understand something about the meaningful parts of words and how English words are put together. And some etymology helps too. So to understand English spelling, it's really helps to know something about the history of the language. Where did these spelling patterns come from? English has a reputation for being this wacky language that's full of exceptions, but it's not. It's like this melting pot language that has complex spelling patterns because English has roots in all these other languages, in Greek and Latin and French and more. So written English is perhaps the most difficult alphabetic language to learn. It takes two to three years for a typically developing reader to master the basics of written English. In contrast, it takes only a few months for most kids in Italy, for example, to learn how to decode Italian because Italian spelling is almost perfectly regular. Italian is spelled the way it sounds. So one of the reasons I think that we have fought so much about reading instruction in the English speaking world, because it's all over the English speaking world, this fight. And I think we are arguing about it because there's a lot to teaching children written English. So there's a lot to argue about in terms of how to teach it. And there's a lot to figure out. So back to Scarborough's rope and the elements of the word recognition strand. So there's phonological awareness, understanding the sounds and words. There's decoding, understanding how letters represent those sounds. And there is also something called sight recognition of familiar words. And this, in my opinion, is where things get really interesting. When you're a skilled reader, you don't actually have to decode most of the words you encounter. When you see a word that you've read several times before, you know the word immediately on site. You don't have to sound it out. Scientists refer to the words that are instantly recognizable to us as sight words. Now the term sight words can be really confusing because teachers and reading scientists usually mean different things when they use that term. So in schools, sight words are typically words kids are supposed to memorize. But what the science shows is that having kids memorize lots of words is not the best path to good word recognition skills. And it turns out that weak word recognition skills are the most common and most debilitating source of reading problems. Struggling readers may also have other issues. They may have language comprehension issues, but when children do not get off to a good start with decoding, it has an impact on the continued development of their language comprehension. And eventually kids may be weak on the language comprehension side because they're weak on the word recognition side. This problem has been described as the Matthew effect. It's a biblical reference. So basically when it comes to reading, the rich get richer. And here's how it works. If you come into school with lots of language comprehension, but you struggle with learning how to decode words, your ability to continue to develop language comprehension may be impeded because one of the best ways to increase your knowledge and your vocabulary and your reasoning and your understanding of the structure of language is through reading. In contrast, if you come into school weak on the language comprehension side, but you're taught how to decode, you have just been given the gift that is your best bet for gaining knowledge and vocabulary because you can decode the words. This is why equity in education begins with good phonics instruction in the early grades. It is one of the most important things teachers can do to try to even the playing field between kids who come from homes that give them an edge on the language comprehension side and kids who come from homes that may not be as rich and resourced when it comes to vocabulary development and access to knowledge. Good phonics instruction is where educational equity begins. It doesn't end there, but it's a critical foundation. Okay, at this point, um, Karen, could you um, open up those breakout rooms in a minute and think about what are some of the things that you heard from Emily that confirmed or affirmed your thinking? And what were some additional um, little nuggets that you could pull from her conversation? So we're gonna give you about six minutes to um, have some conversation on that. So Karen. Okay, so as folks are coming back in, I will let you know that we had some um, 
we had some people wonder where they could find access to this video and uh, Jeannie did put the link, the YouTube link in there. It's also in our Literacy Resources Hub. You, um, if you click on 2020 um, Literacy Symposium, you can find it in there as well with um, a facilitation handout. Um, so without any further ado, um, I hope that you had some great conversations as you were um, now the good kind of publishers and authors of great as you were in your breakout rooms um, and uh, we're going to watch part two of this at the at Tell this point. Curiosity. Remember to take notes as we listen to Emily. That if their stuff is going to have a chance of being considered research based, there has to be some phonics. And if they didn't know that or believe it until recently, they're quickly adding a phonics component now. So that means we must be on the right path, that reading instruction is finally starting to line up with the science. Unfortunately, I don't know if that's necessarily the case, because while more and more schools are adding a phonics block, what I also see in schools are things like this. <clears throat> so you've probably seen these. These are word reading strategies that you will find in schools all over the country. I have seen these strategies everywhere on posters in classrooms, bookmarks that get sent home with kids. They're on Pinterest, they're on Teachers Pay Teachers. I've also seen things like this. So these are all strategies for kids to use when they're reading and they come to a word they don't know. And these strategies seem sensible enough. You get to a word you don't know, what can you do? You can look at the picture and try to figure out what the word might be. You don't want to completely guess, so you can look at the first letter. You can, you can look at how the word begins. That will narrow your choices. You can then check to see if you're right. Reread the sentence using the word, see if the sentence makes sense. And if you're stuck, you can just skip the word and move on. Hopefully you can get the gist of the sentence anyway. What's the theory of how reading works that these strategies are based on? What's the idea about how kids learn to read words? Those are the questions that I became very interested in as a reporter. So these strategies are rooted in a theory about reading that came to be known as three cueing. So the basic idea is that readers use three different kinds of information or cues to identify words as they're reading. So the idea was originally proposed by the late Ken Goodman back in 1967 at the American Educational Research Association Conference in New York. He laid out the original theory in a paper that he called Reading, a Psycholinguistic Guessing Game. In the paper, Goodman rejected the idea that reading is a precise process that involves exact or detailed perception of letters or words. Instead, he argued that as people read, they make predictions about the words on the page using these three cues. So graphic cues, what do the letters tell you about what the word might be? Syntactic cues, what kind of a word could it be? For example, a noun or a verb and semantic cues, what word would make sense here based on the context. So in his paper, Goodman concluded this. He wrote, skill in reading involves not greater precision, but more accurate first guesses based on better sampling techniques, greater control over language structure, broadened experiences, and increased conceptual development. As the child develops reading skill and speed, he uses increasingly fewer graphic cues. So this was kind of a new twist on prevailing ideas about how reading works. And it went on to become a theoretical basis of the whole language approach to teaching reading. For the couple of centuries previous to the introduction of whole language back in the 1960s, 70s, the debate about how reading works and how to teach it had focused on one of two big ideas. So one idea is that reading is a visual memory process. The teaching method associated with this idea is the whole word method. It's not quite the same as whole language, so whole word. The basic idea is that if you see words enough and you associate the words with their meaning, you eventually store those words in your memory as like visual images. So this is the idea behind long lists of sight words that kids are supposed to memorize. The other idea is that reading requires knowledge of the relationships between sounds and letters and that the way to identify a word is to sound it out. That's the phonics approach, basically. So reading instruction was really a series of pendulum swings between whole word and phonics until this new idea came along that said, 
People don't read by sounding out words and they don't read by memorizing words as wholes either. Instead, they use this cueing system. That is, they use context to predict what the words will be and they use the letters to check their predictions. Many teachers know this cueing theory of word reading. They've never heard of three cueing, but they know this other thing called MSV. So M is for using meaning to figure out what a word is. S is for using syntax or sentence structure. And V is for using visual information. That is the letters in the word. You will find this MSV idea in lots of curriculum materials that define themselves as balanced literacy. You can trace the roots of this MSV idea back to the work of a woman named Mari Clay. Mari Clay was a developmental psychologist in New Zealand who came up with ideas about reading that were similar to Ken Goodman's ideas at about the same time. They didn't develop these ideas together. They didn't agree on everything, but they did meet and travel in similar literacy circles in the 1980s and 90s. Clay built her ideas into a reading intervention program for struggling first graders called Reading Recovery. Reading Recovery was implemented across New Zealand in the 1980s, and it went on to become one of the most widely used reading intervention programs in the world. Clay's theories about reading were popularized as part of core reading instruction here in the United States by Irene Fountas and Gay Sue Pinnell. They learned from Clay in the 1980s. Fountas and Pinnell are very well known in education for an approach to reading instruction known as guided reading for a widely used assessment system that uses what are known as leveled hooks, the benchmark assessment system. And Fountas and Pinnell also sell a reading intervention program called Leveled Literacy Intervention or LLI. Education Week did a survey of elementary school teachers last fall and they found that 43%, 43% of elementary school teachers reported using LLI. You will find lots of examples of that meaning, structure, visual idea in Fountas and Pinnell books, products, and materials. You will also find MSV and queuing in the Units of Study series written by Lucy Calkins. She's a professor at Teachers College Columbia. Units of Study is more commonly referred to as Reader's Workshop. According to the Ed Week survey that I just mentioned, 16% of teachers reported using Units of Study to teach reading. That makes it the third most widely used set of materials for teaching reading in this country. You will find some phonics in the Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell approaches. In fact, Lucy Calkins recently created a Units of Study for teaching phonics programs. Fountas and Pinnell have books and materials to teach phonics too. They have for a long time. But phonics is often presented as one way to know what a word is. It's one strategy. It's that third cue in the three cueing system. What schools need to know is that when they buy materials from Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell, they're buying an approach to teaching reading that is rooted in a particular theory, a particular theory about how reading works. And it's this idea that skilled readers use meaning and context to identify words as they read. So what you are likely to find in a lot of American classrooms today is 20 or 30 minutes of a phonics program and then readers workshop or guided reading where kids are taught that when they come to a word they don't know, they can sound it out and use what they've learned in their phonics lessons, but they can also use other strategies. They can think about a word that makes sense. They can look at the first letter of the word, or they can just take a page from Skippy the Frog and skip the word altogether. So the question really is, what's wrong with this? Like, why not teach kids lots of strategies to help them when they come to a word they don't know? It seems sensible. But the answer comes back to the scientific research on reading and how it works. So what is going on in these little boys' brains as they're learning to read? And the thing is that for a long time, a very long time, no one knew. But as you know, Scientists in labs and classrooms all over the world have done a mountain of studies over the past several decades about how skilled reading works. And here is a key thing that they figured out. Skilled readers do not use cues and context to read words. In fact, what scientists have discovered is that this is how poor readers read. Poor readers tend to have a hard time with word identification. Too many of the words they come across are series of letters they don't immediately know and maybe can't quite figure out. So they use a bunch of other strategies to try to understand what the words say. They memorize as many words as they can. When they come across a word they don't know, they look at the first letter, first few letters, they try to think of a word that makes sense. In other words, they use context to try to come up with a word that fits. And when they can't figure out what a word is using context clues, they skip the word. Often, they can get the gist of what they're reading this way, but, Using context, guessing and skipping words, this is not what reading is like when you're a skilled reader. 
What cognitive scientists have figured out is that a key difference between skilled readers and unskilled readers is that skilled readers can immediately and accurately recognize words. They don't need to guess or predict or use context. Skilled readers know tens of thousands of words instantly on sight. In fact, if you're a skilled reader, your brain has gotten so good at reading words that you process the word book faster than you process a picture of a book. How did your brain get so good at that? Because as we know, we're not born with brains that are designed to do this. So how do our brains get so good at reading words? It happens through this process called orthographic mapping. And that term sounds so complex and weedy and intimidating, you know, weedy, intimidating, and it really is, but it's really, really crucial, I think. I think educators have to understand just the basics of orthographic mapping to understand why phonics is so important and to understand why teaching all those word reading strategies is not a good idea. So here is a quick and simplified explanation of what orthographic mapping is. So orthographic mapping is the process we use to store printed words in our long-term memory. So this is not about memorizing words. The way you orthographically map a word to your memory is by attending closely to how the written word is spelled and then linking that sequence of letters to the word's pronunciation and its meaning. So a very simple example, a child knows the meaning and pronunciation of the word cat. The word gets orthographically mapped to her memory when she links the sounds, cat, to the word, written word, C-A-T. So this requires an awareness of the speech sounds and words, phonemic awareness. It requires an understanding of how those sounds are represented by letters, that's phonics. So you need phonemic awareness and phonics to orthographically map words into your long-term memory. Once a word has been orthographically mapped to your memory, you know it instantly on sight. In fact, you cannot suppress your ability to read that word. You don't have to sound out the word when you see it. You know it instantly because at some point you successfully sounded it out and you linked the spelling of the word with the word's pronunciation and its meaning. So by about second grade, a typically developing reader who's acquired good phonemic awareness and phonics skills needs just a few exposures to a word through its pronunciation, its spelling, and its meaning, and bam, the word is orthographically mapped to her memory. Now, the more words that she maps to her memory this way, the more she can focus on the meaning of what she's reading. She's not using her brain power to identify words. She's using her brain power to understand what she's reading. And this is the goal, for readers to comprehend what they're reading. For some reason, debates about reading have ended up stuck in an argument about whether teachers should focus on helping kids learn to decode words or whether they should focus on reading comprehension. But that debate makes no sense. How can you fully comprehend what you're reading if you can't accurately read the words? So let me give you another orthographic mapping example. A few years ago when my son was uh, in about 10th grade, he was reading something out loud to me and he said, epitome. So I stopped him and I asked, epitome, do you mean epitome? So there's the word. Oh, so my son said, you could practically see the light bulbs going off in his head, epitome. My son had obviously heard that word before. Maybe he had a basic sort of gist of it kind of idea of what the word means. He may have come across the word in print before too, paused, sounded it out, epitome, hmm, don't know that word. But now reading aloud to me, he had had the aha moment he needed to realize that's a word I know. So we briefly discussed the meaning of the word. Here it is, epitome, a person or thing that's a perfect example of a particular type or quality. So the next time my son sees that word in print, he's going to know what it is. And the science suggests that with another few exposures, that word will be permanently stored in his memory. He'll see it and know it. The spelling, the pronunciation, the meaning, it'll all be there for him. What scientists have discovered is that skilled word reading is like a reflex. It's not a detective game. It's not contextual guessing. It's not a series of strategic actions. It's automatic and it's effortless. However, as, as you can see in the example of my son, there is much more than decoding skill at play. Readers must have a good oral vocabulary. My son had heard the word epitome. The light bulbs wouldn't have gone off for him if he hadn't. Your ability to comprehend what you read <clears throat> is tightly linked to your vocabulary and your knowledge. That's one reason that reading scores tend to be associated with family income and educational background. Knowing the meaning of lots of words gives you an advantage, an edge when it comes to orthographic mapping and when it comes to understanding what you read. And having a mom who hears you read epitome and clues you into the fact that the word is epitome, well, that helps a whole lot too. 
Family background matters. It can tilt the scales in your favor, especially on the language comprehension side of things. But having a big oral vocabulary and lots of knowledge isn't enough. By some estimates, a third of struggling readers are from college-educated families. Children need to be taught how to read the words on the page. <clears throat> Excuse me. They need to be taught how their written language works. And when teachers use the queuing system that I told you about, when they teach all those word reading strategies, they're actually impeding the orthographic mapping progress, uh, process. So let me explain that with a story. So these are first graders in Oakland, California. So a teacher who worked with these girls came to see that teaching the queuing system or that MSV idea, meaning structure visual, that was actually making it harder for her students to learn how to read. The teacher's name is Margaret Goldberg. She was hired by the Oakland Unified School District to teach level literacy intervention. LLI is the reading intervention program that I mentioned that was developed by Irene Fountas and Gay Sue Pinnell. LLI does include some phonics instruction. It also teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they have lots of strategies for figuring out the word. They can sound it out, but they can also use pictures and context and other cues to try to come up with a good guess. So Margaret Goldberg started teaching LLI. Around the same time, she found a bunch of unopened materials sitting on a shelf in her school collecting dust. And it was a systematic phonics and phonemic awareness program that teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they sound it out. And kids in this program practice reading in books that contain words with spelling patterns that they've been taught. So they don't have to guess at words. Margaret started teaching some of her groups LLI with the cueing strategies. And some of her groups she taught systematic phonics and phonemic awareness with no cueing. And she started to notice differences between the two groups of children, not just in how well they were reading, but in the way they approached their reading. So she and a colleague recorded first graders talking about what makes them readers. So I'm going to play this video for you. Mia's in the white shirt. She was learning phonics with no cueing. And Jabri is in the pink jacket. She was taught the cueing system. Guess what makes you good readers? I learn a lot. Because I look at the pictures and I read it. Ooh. Do you remember when you were little and you didn't know how to read? Yes. Mm. Like when you started Kinda. kindergarten? Yeah. What helped you learn how to read? How did you learn? By looking, looking at, at the, the pictures. Anything else? Looking at the words and sounding them out. So Margaret Goldberg was seeing this over and over again in her two groups of students. One group was taking away from their reading instruction that reading is about looking closely at words and sounding them out. And another group of children was learning that when you come to a word you don't know, you don't have to look at it carefully and try to connect the spelling with the pronunciation and the meaning. Instead, you can look away from the word. You can look at the pictures, you can look at the other words in the sentence. Basically, you search around for clues to help you identify the word. Now remember, orthographic mapping requires you to look carefully at words so your brain links the spelling with the sounds and the meaning. But cueing teaches kids to look away from words. Here's what Margaret Goldberg said to me about the children in her LLI groups. I did lasting damage to these kids. It was so hard to ever get them to stop looking at a picture to guess what a word would be. It was so hard to ever get them to slow down and sound a word out because they had had this experience of knowing that you predict what you read before you read it. As Margaret was noticing the differences between her two groups of students, she was discovering the scientific research on reading. It was not stuff she knew or had been taught. She was shocked by what she was learning and how different it was from what the curriculum materials, materials were telling her about how reading works. But what Margaret was learning from the curriculum materials about how reading works is what lots of teachers are learning about how reading works. Instructional approaches that include cueing are all over American classrooms. A lot of kids are being taught phonics and they're also being taught cueing. Now, some children can overcome this contradiction. They figure out pretty quickly that sounding out a word is the most efficient way to know what it is. They drop the cueing strategies and begin building that big bank of instantly recognizable words that is so crucial for becoming a skilled reader. But some kids cling to the cueing strategies because those are easier at first. And by using cueing strategies, many children can look like good readers, especially when they have good language comprehension skills. They can look like good readers until they get to about <clears throat> third or fourth grade, when their books begin to have more words, longer words, and fewer pictures. And then they're stuck. They haven't developed their word reading skills. Reading is slow and laborious, and they don't like it, so they don't do it if they don't have to. And while their peers, 
who mastered decoding early are reading and teaching themselves new words every day. The kids who clung to the queuing approach with all those word reading strategies I showed you before, those kids are falling further and further behind. So <clears throat> At a Loss for Words is a podcast episode and article where I tried to explain the problems with the queuing and strategies approach to teaching reading. As I said earlier, a lot of schools seem to be doing some kind of phonics instruction these days. And most publishers know that they need to have some kind of phonics instruction in place for the materials to have a chance of being considered research-based. But just because a school has added phonics does not mean that reading instruction aligns with the scientific research on reading. If children are being taught the cueing research, they're being taught to read the way that poor readers read. This, I think, is a big elephant in the room when it comes to reading instruction in the United States today. Schools and publishers are adding what I've come to think of as a phonics patch. They're checking the phonics box, but they're still teaching cueing. Why? This is a million dollar question, literally. It's a million dollar question because schools have invested a lot of money in instructional materials that teach kids cueing. And schools are better at adding things than they are at taking things away. In other words, it's easier to add phonics than to take away cueing. And many educators believe in cueing. I got an email from a woman who teaches in an upper middle class suburb, a school district with good test scores compared to many school districts in this country. She says the cueing and strategies approach to teaching reading is alive and well in her district, and she has tried to talk to her colleagues about the scientific research on reading, but telling them about the problems with the cueing and strategies approach to teaching reading, she says she has to be really careful about that because she said, it's like walking into a church and yelling, there's no God. Many educators believe in cueing because if they were taught anything about how reading works, they were very likely taught that idea that readers use meaning, structure, and visual cues to identify words as they're reading. They were taught the theory of reading that whole language is based on. They may not think they are teaching whole language, but whole language ideas about how reading skill develops are deeply embedded in their curriculum materials and what they learn in professional development and what they learned in their teacher preparation programs often. <clears throat> and cueing seems to work for some kids because some kids, maybe even most kids in some schools and classrooms, will learn to read no matter how they're taught. They will learn to read in spite of the instruction. They're that 40% in Nancy Young's letter of reading. They learn to read no matter how they're taught. Learning to read is relatively easy for them. But reading is not natural. And for most children, learning to read is actually pretty hard. They need more help than they typically get in school because reading instruction in many schools rests on the assumption that most kids will figure out what they need to know about written language with some guidance and access to a lot of good books. Reading instruction tends to rest on the assumption that learning to read is not that hard for most people. And we need to flip the script, acknowledge that for most humans, learning to read is actually pretty challenging. And a lot of them aren't gonna become good readers and spellers without a lot of good help. This is normal. But right now, literacy instruction is tilted in favor of the minority of people who do not need much instruction to become good readers. And literacy instruction that is tilted in favor of the few is inequitable at its core. It favors those with financial resources, for example, because if they can't get what they need in school, someone will pay for what they need. <clears throat> so this is a picture of Skippy the frog and his friends, and actually they're in a trash barrel. It's a little hard to tell from the picture. A teacher sent this picture to me. I've heard from a lot of teachers who are throwing away Skippy and all of those other word reading strategies that distract kids from the thing that will help them best develop good word recognition skills, looking carefully at words and sounding them out, as Mia the first grader said in the video. But change is hard, always is. And while the science of reading is really well established, it doesn't mean how to teach reading has been settled. I think this is a really important point. The simple view of reading, for example, does not say that reading is simple. It says that reading comprehension can be divided into two parts. It's a simple model for understanding something that's complex. Reading is complex and teaching kids to read is complex. And there's no perfect curriculum. There's no perfect approach. There's no perfect sequence of what to teach. There probably never will be. I think the key to improving reading instruction is teacher knowledge making sure teachers know about the huge body of research on how skilled reading develops. When they know this, they begin to see on their own what is flawed about Skippy the Frog. I have talked to lots of teachers who have had this aha moment for themselves when they dig into the research. But 
As educators make an effort to move away from flawed practices that are rooted in some ideas that have turned out not to be correct about reading, it's important really to acknowledge good things that came from whole language, for example, and to remember that whole language emerged in the 1960s and 70s in response to concerns about how reading was being taught. So in some schools, there was an emphasis on the decoding and word recognition side of things without much emphasis on the other stuff. So maybe there was phonics instruction, but there wasn't enough focus on the bigger picture, the language comprehension, the knowledge building, the vocabulary development. Whole language came along as a challenge to traditional phonics instruction. Whole language of the 1960s was not informed by the scientific research because that research was yet to come, but neither was traditional phonics instruction. We were doing phonics instruction long before we really know how kids learn to read. So it's important for everyone who cares about kids being taught to read in ways that line up with the scientific evidence to look closely at phonics instruction too. Phonics instruction may focus too much on sounds and symbols and not enough on other things that a child needs to know to understand how written English works, for example. Some phonics advocates sometimes fail to appreciate the language comprehension part of the equation. I hear from teachers and tutors and researchers about this. They see kids being explicitly taught how letters and sounds work, but not being asked to then connect this enough to reading, not being asked to apply what they're learning to comprehension. In classrooms that are trying hard to get foundational skills right, there may not be enough time devoted to the development of language comprehension and knowledge. So that's inequitable instruction too. So as I begin to wrap up, I wanna say just a few things about teachers. As an education reporter, I have spent countless hours in classrooms observing instruction, talking to teachers about what they do. Two big takeaways from that, we ask a lot of our teachers in this country. And teaching is really hard to do well. It takes an incredible amount of expertise and experience. This country does not value good teaching as much as it should. In fact, the opposite. Teachers are often underappreciated and underpaid. And as Dana Goldstein of the New York Times wrote a few years ago, teaching has become the most controversial profession in America. Why is that? Well, I think it rooted has to do with the fact that teaching is so important. What children learn in school, it really matters. And it especially matters that they're taught how to read. Reading is a foundation upon which all other academic learning is built. Reading is a key, the key. I hear from some teachers who feel right now that they are being blamed for poor reading skills. They don't like this science of reading conversation because they hear it as part of this blame game. So Margaret Goldberg, the literacy coach in Oakland, who I told you about before, she actually wrote a blog post that addresses this. It's called Teachers Won't Embrace Research Until It Embraces Them. And it begins like this. Margaret wrote, I understand why advocates, researchers, and policymakers who feel the urgency of our literacy crisis are frustrated when teachers don't embrace reading science. But my entry into the world of reading research was difficult. And while I take pride in my determination to learn, I understand why other teachers might be deterred. If we want teachers to apply research, it may be helpful to think about why they aren't. Asking teachers to move away from balanced literacy is asking them to break from the people and materials they have trusted, to abandon much of what they've been told about teaching, and to rethink things that may have inspired them to enter the profession. If we want teachers to walk away from a familiar and empathetic professional community, they need to be warmly welcomed into something new. And the piece includes this chart, which I think I have time to read this to you because I don't know if you all can see this very well. So let's see. I'm going to read this to you real quick. Here's what her chart says. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was an expert because I was told you know your students best. In the reading science community, I found that teachers were described as unprepared and ineffective. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that reading was described in terms that match my own memory of learning to read, natural and magical. In the reading science community, I found that reading was a complex neurological process that I didn't understand, and phrases like curriculum casualties and reading failure terrified me. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that my role was simple and pleasurable because I believe students learn to read by reading. I match students with books while watching and encouraging their progress. In the reading science community, I found that I'd be to blame if any of my students did not become skilled readers. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was a good reader. Books and articles were enjoyable, easy to read, and often included anecdotes to which I could relate. In the reading science community, I found that articles included words I'd never encountered before, concepts I didn't understand, graphs I couldn't read, and references to studies I didn't know. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was welcomed and spoken to with respect, if not with admiration, by the presenters. They understood my job. I left with concrete strategies to try with my students the next day. In the reading science community, I found that 
At conferences, I was not the intended audience and comments about teachers not only made me feel unwelcome, but discouraged me from inviting my colleagues. I left rethinking important ideas, but without knowing how to apply what I've learned. And finally, in the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was aligned with my colleagues, my supervisors, the people who trained me and the educators I knew to admire. But in the reading science community, I found that I became an outsider in my district and until I connected with others, I felt alone. So I think it's really important for people who are trying to advance the science of reading to think about this chart. Teachers need support. They need help translating the research into practice. And some of them are feeling attacked. I've tried very hard in my reporting not to blame teachers. I don't know of a teacher who does not want to teach her or his students how to read. But too many teachers are not being taught what they need to know to be able to do that. That is unfair to teachers and it is unfair to kids. I will end with something I saw on Twitter. It was in response to someone expressing concern that teachers are being turned off by the science of reading conversation. The person posted this. As the conversation around reading practice builds, I'm worried that we're losing a lot of teachers right now. And here was one of the replies. I often wonder if there's a way to reframe the conversation, to portray this as an absolutely amazing time to be in education, a moonshot, to say helping every kid read proficiently is hard and means doing things in a new way, but we can do it. So thank you for your time today. I will leave you with my contact information and a webpage where you can find all of the APM Reports podcasts and articles about reading. It's all collected in one place. All right. Um, so I know that Emily's words are so motivating and insightful. So I want to you to um, reflect on maybe one or two things that you can commit to back in your classroom or building based on what we you have learned. And you may either put that in a chat. Maggie's going to drop a link to a Padlet in a chat um, for us. And if you can just take a minute to think about what you commit to doing back in your classroom or building based on what you've heard in Emily's, you can drop that either in the chat or jot that on the Padlet. And I will pull that Padlet up in a minute to share that. Maggie just dropped, dropped that Padlet link into the chat. So go ahead and um, click on that and jot your thoughts or one thing that you commit to doing. I see we have a number of people who are typing away. That's awesome to see. Folks are going to continue to look at the reading research, pull up more information on orthographic mapping. Um, wow, stay grounded in the science of reading. Look at um, the structured literacy, share the video with their coworkers. Um, good. I see a lot of lot of really great ideas. And one of my um, folks are sharing, share the message of other, with others. Great. Um, Let's see, let me scroll down here, see if I can pull some others up. Continue the reading research and not focus on cueing. Great. Um, finding text with um, patterns that students already have um, learned. And I think we someone shared the link to some of the decodable text resources out of the Reading League. And that's a great resource if you're looking for more on decodable text. Um, it, um, include more orthographic mapping, focus on phonics patterns. Um, let's see, anyone see anything else of my colleagues that you wanna jump in and share, go ahead. I don't know what's in the, 
if there's anything else in the chat, share Emily's videos, um, the video. And the nice thing that's on the video, um, there is a facilitator's handout as well that has some additional guided questions. That's on the Literacy Resource Hub um, as well. So great. And thanks for all your participation in both the chat and on the Padlet. Oh, I love this when we know better, we do better. Um, so true. And not they're not going to use the three queuing systems at any anymore. So with that, um, it's 11.55, and I think we will stop and break for lunch. And Jeannie also, also put a guided notes uh, handout um, for uh, your reference and, and use uh, if you want to use it uh, during this afternoon's beginning portion of, of today. We'll get started here in just another minute. Okay, uh, my time says 1255. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back. And um, we hope you had a nice lunch. Um, we're going to move forward with this afternoon's content. But before uh, we do that, I um, uh, just want to thank um, both Karen Brady and Sherry Hartman uh, for their efforts this morning. Um, Sherry brought us to tears. Uh, thanks, Sherry. Thanks a lot. Uh, but it was it was very, very good content. Um, Sherry's a very nice person. She wouldn't do that deliberately. So sometimes some of that's tough to get through, but um, Emily Hanford's worth it every time. I also want to acknowledge um, our uh, statewide literacy lead, Pam Kasner, Dr. Pam Kasner. I think she um, might have been on the call this morning. I don't know if she's rejoined us for this afternoon, but um, because we're talking about the science of reading, um, uh, I would want to acknowledge that um, Pam uh, and Jeannie uh, from the West and Andra, who you're gonna hear from in a minute uh, through this recording on phonemic awareness, um, all serve as our regional and state leads for literacy. And uh, we've all been working together under this cause um, for uh, what seems to be a very long time. And so um, I want to just say on behalf of Pam and the literacy team and everyone who contributes to um, the science of reading in both theory and practice that they've just done a stellar job uh, moving the state of Pennsylvania in the right direction. And um, under their efforts, we have the largest number of letters, language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling trainers in the United States. That is no small feat. It's an investment of a lot of uh, time and effort and um, partnerships with the scientific community um, to help you and others um, best in best practice. Uh, and uh, so I can't say enough about everything that they do. And so um, we're delighted this afternoon to have um, Jeannie Hertzler, uh, Andra and Amy Cavalier, who also serves on the Literacy Initiative and the MTSS Initiative kind of kick us off with some information around the practice of advanced phonemic awareness and resources uh, that you can really kind of use, uh, not tomorrow, but at the beginning of the school year um, to help you advance this cause. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeannie. Am I turning it over to you or to Andra or to Amy? <laughs> Actually, it'll Me be Jen. Amy. <laughs> okay. You know what? It's one out of three, a 33% <laughs> chance. Okay. So go ahead, Amy, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome back. We hope you had an enjoyable lunch. Um, my name, as Jen said, is Amy Cavalier, and I'm joined this afternoon by my colleagues, Je Jeannie Hertzler and Andra Bell. Um, we have two goals for the next session um, one is we are going to highlight the importance of teaching phonemic awareness to advanced levels um, because research shows how critical advanced phonemic awareness is um, because it, it greatly impacts um, phonics and orthographic mapping. 
um, that we turn we heard Emily Hanford talking about. Um, so many students who struggle with those foundational reading skills also struggle with advanced phonemic awareness skills. Um, our second goal for today is to share some important resources with you. Um, it's our hope that these resources will help you plan for instruction around this very important topic. So in order to meet these goals, we're going to start out using a patent quick pick, which is housed on our YouTube channel, along with other valuable resources. Um, we hope you had the opportunity to either download or print the guided notes for the phonemic awareness um, session today so that you can follow along with the quick pick. Um, if you're using the electronic version, you can type your answers in the blanks as we go. Um, if you're using the paper and pencil version, you can be writing those down. And then what we'll do is we'll stop periodically to review the answers um, for what has been covered so far. Um, if you should have a question um, during the se section, you can drop that in the chat box um, and we'll answer those questions as we are able. And then one last um, note, um, following the video, we will provide a link for the answer key um, for those who wish to self check check their answers or who for those who wish to take this activity back to their schools and use it um, as a professional development um, activity with their um, colleagues. So without further ado. Hello and welcome. My name is Andra Bell and I am a contributing educational consultant to Patton's Literacy Initiative. Today we will be talking about advanced phonemic awareness and its importance in the development of word reading skills. The mission of Patton is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local educational agencies to serve students who receive special education services. Our goal for each child is to ensure IEP teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. I hope you will leave this session with a clear sense of the terms phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, and phonics, as well as an understanding of the three levels of phonological awareness, specifically advanced phonemic awareness and how it impacts word level reading. We will practice some advanced phonemic awareness skills today, and I will also provide you with some resources so you can implement these activities in your classroom. Additionally, classroom videos will be shared to show you what it looks like and sounds like with actual students. Here is a continuum of phonological awareness skills. Phonological awareness is the umbrella term for a broad set of skills that includes identifying and manipulating units of oral language, such as words, syllables, onsets and rhymes, and phonemes. The continuum goes from the largest chunks of oral language to the smallest. The smallest unit of language is individual sounds or phonemes. We'll talk more about this continuum and clarify the term phonemic awareness. A phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. So phoneme or phonemic awareness is the ability to hear and manipulate those individual sounds. Phonological awareness is the awareness of sounds only. It is void of print. No letters are introduced. No sound to symbol correspondence is taught. Phonemic awareness is a skill under the umbrella term phonological awareness. Phonemic awareness is when we drill down to single sounds in words. For example, cat has three sounds. K, a, t. Step has four sounds. S, t, e. Shop has three sounds, sh, a, uh, p. Phonics involves the eyes and ears. Phonological awareness involves just the ears. Phonemic awareness skills require manipulation of the smallest units of sounds. You can have phonemic awareness without phonics, but you cannot have phonics without phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness skills are prerequisite skills for phonics. You may hear people say you can do these activities in the dark or with your eyes closed, but a caution here, it's best to see how the mouth moves and is shaped when making sounds. 
not for letters to be seen, but to see the placement of the lips, teeth, and tongue to distinguish between sounds that are similar. Again, phonological awareness is the umbrella term that includes many skills. Phonemic awareness is included under this term. When we work with manipulating single speech sounds and words, when we work at the phoneme level, we call this phonemic awareness. Phoneme segmenting and blending is where we know students are ready for basic phonics skills. Our basic phoneme awareness skills prepare us for basic phonics skills. When students can segment and blend at least three sounds, they are ready for basic phonics. Phoneme deletion and manipulation is where we know these advanced phonemic awareness skills prepare students for advanced phonics skills, the gold star. We don't want to stop instruction at blending and segmenting. We want to make sure to teach and practice advanced phoneme awareness skills with students. When students are able to delete and manipulate sounds, they are ready for advanced phonic skills. We'll talk about the research that supports this, as well as the timeline for developing these skills. All right, that brings us to our first stopping point. Um, if you're following along with the guided notes, um, it says phonological awareness is the umbrella term that includes identifying and manipulating units of oral language, such as words, syllables, onsets and rhymes, and phonemes. The smallest lang unit of language is individual sounds or phonemes. A phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. So phoneme or phonemic awareness is the ability to hear and manipulate those sounds. Phonics involves the eyes and ears. Phonological awareness involves just the ears. Phonemic awareness skills are prerequisite skills for phonics. Phonemic, phoneme segmenting and blending is where we know students are ready for basic phonic skills. And we don't want to stop instruction at blending and segmenting. We want to make sure to teach and practice advanced phoneme awareness skills with students. All right. Word level reading is greatly impacted by a person's phonological acuity. If students have difficulty with phonological skills, they most likely will struggle with some or all aspects of developing word reading skills. There are three levels of phonological skills, early, basic, and advanced. Early phonological awareness skills will typically develop in preschool. Rhyme, alliteration, the ability to segment words into syllables, and identify the beginning sounds in words. Basic phonological awareness typically develops throughout kindergarten and first grade with the ability to blend and segment phonemes. Typically, these skills are mastered by most students by the end of first grade. Advanced phonological awareness involves manipulation of phonemes and continues to develop until about third or fourth grade. Next, we'll talk about how these skills are critical and support the development of phonic skills. Early phonological awareness skills are the key to developing early phonic skills, particularly letter sound knowledge. This knowledge predicts later reading development as strongly evidenced by decades of research support showing students require letter sound knowledge to phonically decode words. Please note that this knowledge, letter sound knowledge, then promotes development in basic phonemic awareness skills, which takes us to our next slide. Phoneme blending and segmenting facilitate development of basic phonics decoding and early spelling skills. Phonic decoding skills promote the growth of advanced phonemic awareness skills in typical readers. However, for our struggling readers, readers with a phonological core deficit even if they are given intervention, development of advanced phonemic awareness, which is needed for efficient sight vocabulary, will not be automatic. It needs to be directly, explicitly taught. As stated previously, advanced phonemic awareness skills, deletion, substitution, and reversal support the development of sight word vocabulary. These skills facilitate the ability to map many words, storing them in our long-term memory. In David Kilpatrick's book, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties, 
He defines orthographic mapping as the mental process used to store words for immediate, effortless retrieval. It is the mechanism for sight word learning. It requires advanced phonemic awareness, letter sound knowledge, and phonological long-term memory. Let's try some phoneme deletion activities. I'll give you some directions. You try to delete the phonemes as asked. Listen and try first. Then I'll show you on the screen. Say spot. Delete the first sound. What word? Say paste. Now say paste without the t. What word? Say the word six. Now say six without the k. What word? Say the word trap. Delete the second sound. What word? Now let's see how you did. Here are the answers. Number one, the sounds were s, p, a, t. When you delete s, we get pot. Two, the sounds were p, a, s, t. When you delete the t, we get pace. Three, the sounds were s, i, k, s. When you delete the k, we get sis. Four, the sounds were t, r, a, p. When you delete the r, we get tap. Please note that deleting the first sound is the easiest, then the last sound, and then the medial sound is most difficult. Additionally, it is more difficult to delete a sound from a blend in the initial or final positions. This activity requires many skills. First, a person has to hold the word in their working memory, segment each phoneme, delete the requested sound, blend the new word back together, all in their working memory, and say the new word. I also want to point out that I'm showing you printed letters here in order for you to see how these activities are done. But when these activities are done with students, there shouldn't be any print shown to them at all. All right, that brings us to our next check-in point. Um, we started out with the labeling the levels of phonological awareness. So from left to right, those were early, basic, and advanced. Advanced phonemic awareness needs to be directly, explicitly taught. Orthographic mapping is the mental process used to store words for immediate effortless retrieval. It is the mechanism for sight word learning. It requires phonemic awareness, letter sound knowledge, and phonological long-term memory. And then she went through the um, phoneme deletion, um, what word, and you can see the answers there on this screen. Um, so for phoneme deletion, we have this activity requires many skills. First, a person has to hold their, the word in their working memory, um, segment each phoneme, delete the requested sound, blend the new word back together and say the word. And then one question, when doing phonemic awareness tasks, should the students see the printed word? And of course the answer there is no, they should not. Now, as we move forward, um, Andra, the presenter, is going to explain how to access a Padlet with additional classroom video examples. Um, and we're not going to take the time to go out to the Padlet, she'll prompt us to do that. Um, however, we invite you to access those resources at a later time. And if you're looking at the guided note sheet, the link um, for those classroom videos, uh, the example is on um, the, uh, the guided note sheet. So you can take a look at those at a later time. Again, we will not, um, will not go out to the Padlet right now. I'd like to share some classroom videos to show how this might look in action. I've created a Padlet with all videos from this QuickPick posted and collected in one place so you can watch them more than once. 